Okay. The next item of business is debate on motion 4138 in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville on reducing the cost of the school day for low income families. I would invite members who wish to take part in the debate to press the request to speak buttons or place an R in the chat function as soon as possible. And I call on Shirley Ann Somerville to speak to and move the motion for around 15 minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to be able to um, open this debate and move the motion in my name on a very important issue on the reduction of the costs of the school day. Child poverty is an issue which we would, of course, all wish to see eradicated, and this debate provides an opportunity to consider the actions which we can take through schools to reduce the cost of the school day and provide further support to families experiencing low income. These actions, of course, do not stand alone. They are one strand of our work to tackle child poverty and support families. I will use the opportunity today to set out our reports and to highlight the range of actions that we are taking on this important issue. The Government wants the best start and a bright future for all children and young people in Scotland. We want to make this country the best place for them to grow up, a place where they can thrive and prosper as they realise their potential. But all too often that potential is hampered by the blight of poverty and inequality. That is why our national mission to tackle child poverty is so vital. Our second Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan, published only last month, sets out how we will drive forward our national mission, recognising the contributions all parts of society must make for all of Scotland. It sets a critical path towards meeting the ambitious statutory targets to significantly reduce child poverty by 2030, as laid out in the 2017 Child Poverty Act, unanimously passed by this Parliament. Yes. Pam Duncan Glancy. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for taking this intervention. Does the Cabinet Secretary recognise that three out of four of the child poverty targets will be missed next year? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I think it's very important to recognise, as we did last month, uh, the important work that has been done by this Parliament. But as was also set out, the difficulties that we will continue to have tackling child poverty and indeed all poverty and inequality in this Scotland as we face the uh, the welfare cuts from Westminster and the universal credit £20 cut um, is just but one example. That makes it, does make it exceptionally difficult for us to meet our targets, but we are determined to do so as the Cabinet Secretary laid out when she um, launched that plan uh, just last month. The new plan is backed by up to £113 million of additional investment in 2022-23 including to mitigate the benefit cap to further increase the game-changing Scottish child payment to £25 a week and to deliver a new employability offer for parents. The actions we have set out are putting money in the pockets of families now, helping them to tackle the cost of living crisis and setting a course for sustainable reductions in child poverty by 2030. High quality early learning and childcare can make a huge difference to children's lives, particularly when they are growing up in more disadvantaged circumstances. Evidence shows that accessible and high quality ELC helps to provide children with skills and confidence to carry into school education and is a cornerstone for closing the poverty related attainment gap. Since August 2021, all councils have been offering 1140 hours of funded ELC to eligible children, making high quality early learning and childcare available to families and saving parents up to £4,900 a year for each eligible child. It has been a significant achievement in the face of the pandemic by local government and our local delivery partners in the private, third and voluntary sector to achieve these levels of provision and the uptake we are now seeing, and I would pay credit to the work that they are doing on this issue. Yes. Does the Cabinet Secretary accept that the funding formula that is currently used within our councils is unfair for the PVI sector, and does she agree that there is something that needs to be done in order to sort that? Cabinet Secretary. So, of course, we are investing heavily in ELC right across uh, the provision of this, but we are looking uh, very carefully um, at what is happening with private providers. That is exactly why the government has already taken, undertaken work on the financial health check, for example, and are continuing to work with local authorities um, and private providers uh, to ensure that we not only understand uh, what is happening within the system, but we are acting um, upon that. Um, and the Minister is in close contact, of course, uh, with those providers uh, to talk through those issues with them, um, as I know she has done very regularly. 
Uh, this year, of course, we will also begin engagement with families um, on setting out our ambition for the early learning and childcare to all one and two year olds. This will start in the course of this Parliament with children from low income households. Our vision is to develop an offer that will contribute to supporting the well being of the whole family. And it is important that we engage directly with families, also the early learning sector and academic experts, to design how the new offer can best support children and families. We will be guided by what the evidence tells us about what is best for children and families, depending on the age and stage of the child. As set out in Best Start Bright Futures, tackling child poverty delivery plan for 22-26, we will be also be conducting an eligibility review in order to ensure a coherent joined-up system for families and aligning with plans for the expansion of school-age childcare. We are contributing to reducing costs for families further by committing to transformational reform as we design a new system of wraparound school-age childcare, offering care before and after school and during the holidays, free to low-income families helping to support parents and carers to have secure and stable employment if they wish to do so. Our new system will also help to reduce inequalities in access to a range of activities around the school day for children from low-income households. Children will have access to a range of activities, offering them life-enhancing experiences, including positive learning and developmental opportunities. Building a new system for school-age childcare, which is accessible, affordable and flexible, will play a pivotal role in our mission towards tackling child poverty, especially, of course, for those families on lower incomes. This will have positive outcomes for the parents as well, leading to sustainable employment and increased earnings, enabling families to lift themselves out of poverty. This year, we are also investing £10 million into a targeted Summer 22 offer for children and families in low-income households, which will provide coordinated access to food, childcare and activities during the holidays. The school holidays should be a time for fun, and our Summer 22 offer will support young people with their well-being through access to a range of activities. Furthermore, of course, we will continue to provide funding for the payments, vouchers and meals during all school holidays for those eligible for free school meals on the basis of low income as part of our phased expansion of free school meals. Yes. Stephen Kerr. The Cabinet Secretary, in relation to those who are eligible, for example, for free school meals or for the school clothing grant, what proportion of those entitled to the support uh, are, are actually getting the support? Cabinet Secretary, I can give you time back for all these interventions. I, I presume I think the member um, is talking about um, how many of the, the, the families are coming forward for, for free school meals that we think are eligible for that. And I would recognise this as a challenge that we have, and I would actually say the challenge um, is, is uh, made even more difficult in some ways because of the universality that we have in P1 to 5 and therefore a recognition that we then need to encourage those that aren't on free school meals. So I don't have the exact figures to hand. I'm happy uh, to, to provide those in writing to the member if he doesn't have them um, already. Uh, but it is something that I'm aware we have a challenge on and something we do, do need to look at. And it's made more complicated by the universality. But I think that is a good complication to have in many ways. And of course, I will come back to free school meals and universality later on in my speech. Uh, we also recognise that transformational change is needed um, for providing holistic support for families. That is why, through our programme for government in 2021, we have committed to investing 50, uh, £500 million over the lifetime of this parliament in the whole family wellbeing funding. This will enable the building of a universal holistic support services available in communities right across Scotland, giving families access to the help they need where and when they need it, for as long as they need it. In collaboration with our partners, we are developing an ambitious programme seeking to drive whole system change to shift from crisis intervention to early preventative support. We now have a clear collective vision about what good family support looks like and the key features that characterise it, underpinned by the principles of the promise. Delivering this vision will help families to thrive, to stay together and contribute to key national priorities, including delivering the promise. Martin Whitfield. I'm grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm very grateful um, to be able to take the intervention. 
Does this include looking at the data sharing challenges that exist between local authorities, third sector and charities, and indeed central government when we reach this, because the data seems to be siloed in different places? Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> Well, it is always a challenge when we're talking about um, any holistic approaches, the data sharing and the challenges that, that, are, that are within that. I think we do need to recognise um, that if we are going to have holistic support, we will need to face up to those challenges and find a way through it. And I'm happy to work with the member on that and indeed on other um, issues on the whole Family be Wellbeing Fund, because I do believe this could be generally, genuinely transformational if we get this right, and data is but one of the many challenges that we will face. Uh, President, also, I'm conscious of time and the number of interventions, um, but I will try and get through the rest of my speech. We have um, a bit of time in hand, Cabinet Secretary. We do. Don't. I'm so happy to hear I have more time for interventions, President Officer. Um, as we progress through the new parliamentary term, our mission to tackle the poverty-related attainment gap is, of course, as important as ever. And we're committed to strengthening the links between this and our national mission on child poverty. That is why the Refresh Scottish Attainment Challenge programme that I launched at the end of March has a new mission – to use education to improve outcomes for children and young people impacted by poverty, with a focus on tackling the poverty-related attainment gap. By removing barriers faced as a result of low income, we can ensure children and young people have the same opportunities to succeed. Working together with local authorities, Education Scotland and schools on the back of £750 million investment over the last parliamentary term, we are of course investing uh, £1 billion over the course of this parliamentary term in the Scottish Attainment Challenge programme. I recently announced the pupil equity funding of over half a billion pounds, which will continue to empower our head teachers over the next four years, so schools can support the children and young people who need it most. Local authorities and schools will continue to make local decisions on how best to support children and young people impacted by poverty with funding for the first time allocated to each and every local authority to drive forward a joint mission. Funding will support approaches in the classroom and approaches that reach beyond the school gates to mitigate the barriers to learning caused by poverty. And this is expected to have a long-term impact on the readiness of children and young people impacted by poverty to enter and sustain positive destinations. Michael Mara. I appreciate the uh, Minister giving way. She would recognise that the uh, poverty-related attainment gap is at its widest that it has ever been. Following the pandemic, certainly a huge impact, but the number she quotes represents a cut on last year's money. Can she justify that? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I have said that we are investing uh, £750 million in the last Parliament, £1 billion um, in this Parliament. It, it has, uh, of course, uh, been the case that last financial year uh, we had a £20 million uh, COVID um, premium that we could add um, if only the UK Government had given the Scottish Government the ability to have uh, more consequentials uh, to deal with COVID, which is still very much with the education system over the next financial year. We could have perhaps repeated that. Unfortunately, we are instead in terms of a real terms cut uh, to the funding for the Scottish Government overall. President officer, we spoke earlier on about free school meals and the importance of free school meals, and that is widely recognised. We have been providing free school lunches during school term time to all children primary 1 to 3 since January 2015. We have committed to going even further, and those universal school free lunches are now available to all children in primaries 1 to 5. We will continue with our expansion of universal provision throughout the remainder of this parliamentary term to make free school lunches available to all children in primary and special schools. Indeed, this year's budget includes an additional £42.2 million of funding to support the provision to primary 4 and 5 in special schools and £30 million of capital for initial investment in the infrastructure needed, including dining and catering facilities, ahead of the rollout. A link to this during this parliamentary term we will also work with local authorities to introduce a universal school milk scheme in primary and secondary schools. I will now turn to the school clothing grant. It is important every child in Scotland should be able to attend school feeling comfortable, confident and ready to learn. I know that buying school uniforms is one of the biggest costs associated with attending school. That is exactly why we have increased the national minimum school clothing grant from its previous level of £100 per child to £120 per eligible pupil in primary schools, and up to £150 per eligible pupil in secondary schools last year. This partnership approach with local authorities is supported by £11.8 million of funding to provide that support to local authorities. 
I also appreciate that not all families are eligible to receive the school clothing grant, so that is why we are also introducing statutory guidance for schools during this Parliament. The guidance will seek to assist schools in reducing the cost of school uniforms for families. We will also consult on the principles of a national school uniform policy and use the findings of that consultation to inform the new national guidance. In light of the consultation, the scope of the guidance is yet to be fully confirmed, but it is expected that alongside support for reducing costs of school uniform, the guidance will address equalities issues, clothing for PE and sports, an example of approaches already in place which reduce the cost of uniforms for families. As part of our approach to reducing barriers to participation in education, we have also continued to support the removal of core curriculum costs for primary and secondary pupils. This, of course, ensures that families do not need to meet the cost of resources and materials for practical lessons. We are also supporting families with the cost of instrumental music tuition. We have already provided local authorities with funding to ensure that no parent can be charged for in instrumental music tuition during this academic year, and we are working with ADES and COSLA on a sustainable funding package for the future. As part of our emergency response to the closure of school buildings at the outset of the pandemic, we also provided £25 million in 2021 to tackle digital exclusion. That investment resulted in more than 72,000 of our most disadvantaged children and young people receiving a device to support their learning. Recognising the increasing importance of technology in education, councils across Scotland have invested their own, in their own device rollout programmes, and we understand that in total almost 280,000 devices have been or are in the process of being distributed to learners. The pandemic has reinforced the importance of digital technology, and that is why we are committed to ensuring that every school child in Scotland has access to both a device and connectivity by the end of this Parliament in 2026. I'm afraid I'm already well over my time, um, convener from the committee. My apologies, um, but I'm sure you will make your point for me um, to return to in closing. In conclusion, at this point, though, however, presiding officer, we are working across government and with our partners to deliver our commitments to child poverty. We recognise that our schools and services which support families have a key part to play in delivering our commitments, and we are seeking to change the experiences for those who are affected by low income in order to provide opportunities and experiences, including through education, which help them to reach their full potential. I look forward to hearing from members right across the chamber on their reflections and aspirations for young people during the course of this afternoon's debate, and I move the motion in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, before I call the next speaker, just a reminder, um, given the number of interventions there, that if you do make an intervention, you may find if you want to speak later in the debate, you need to repress uh, your request to speak buttons. And I call Oliver Mundell to speak to Move Amendment 4138.2 for around 11 minutes. Mr Mundell. Thank you, President Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. Back in 2015, Nicola Sturgeon said, and I quote, let me be clear, I want to be judged on this. If you are not, as First Minister, prepared to put your neck on the line uh, for the education of our young people, then what are you prepared to? It really matters. I agreed then, uh, and I agree now. The problem for this SNP Government, and in turn for Scotland's young people, is that that rhetoric and reality have never been further apart. With every passing day, those words become more and more hollow. I have lost track of how many of these debates I have sat through and participated in in the last six years. SNP minister after minister stands up and sets out all these wonderful things they are just about to get round to doing. It is depressing and it borders on the insulting when this SNP government have had 15 years in power to actually get on and do things. All we hear is that it is too hard or too complicated or, best of all, that all the problems will go away if only we dish out a few laptops and promise people a bike. The truth is that many of the problems we are talking about today have been created on the SNP's watch. While it might be politically convenient to scream Tories every time the going gets tough, it is SNP cuts to local government budgets that have seen education squeezed and our schools left so short of resources that they sometimes even struggle to function. We have heard at the Education Committee only this past week that many schools are using attainment funding just to keep the show on the road. 
I know myself, having been lucky enough to be educated before the SNP came to power, that schools used to have enough resources not to have to charge young people for the basics. It did not need to be written into guidance or law. They were able to do the right thing because they had the budget flexibility. Instead, what we see today is an endless stream of policies and announcements at a national level. Lots of alleged new funding, but in turn, we see core school budgets squeezed to the point where stationery and other basic equipment is being topped up by teachers and charitable sources. Certainly. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I believe in 2021 it was the sixth year in a row that education gross revenue expenditure saw a real terms increase that uh, does not exactly match the picture uh, that the member is painting. Oliver Minter. Well, I would be very surprised then if the Cabinet Secretary is speaking to schools, uh, to pupils, to parents, to local authorities uh, who all see resources under more pressure uh, than ever before. And I do not know how any government can claim education as their top priority uh, when schools uh, are struggling uh, to provide the basic materials in order for people to participate fully in lessons. Let us also certainly. Martin Whitfield. I am very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. Um, would you agree with me that it is, seems to be only teachers as a profession who come to us to say that they have to contribute to what they need day to day to make their classrooms work? We do not hear the same from surgeons or indeed lawyers. Oliver Mandel. <clears throat> Yeah, and we certainly don't hear the same from politicians or Scottish Government ministers. Yeah. Uh, so let's also remember uh, that this uh, is a government uh, that was all too happy uh, to oversee a culture of exorbitant charges for music tuition. It's under their watch that this became commonplace. Shamefully now, uh, they come to this chamber and seek our thanks uh, for intervening. But having uh, been in the previous parliament uh, and listened many times uh, to uh, the Deputy First Minister, then Education Secretary, telling us that this could not be done. Uh, I find uh, this all uh, very depressing. Um, and the idea uh, that somehow these were all local choices uh, that councils just came up with um, you know, is, 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 is just not, uh, frankly, uh, believable. Uh, the truth is, uh, this is another uh, symptom of the squeeze uh, we are seeing on education budgets. And again, uh, this routine. Uh, speaks to the true motivations of the SNP. Young people suffer, but it's OK as long as the SNP can put something nice in their manifesto promising to solve a problem uh, they created on their own watch. Then we move on to free school meals and breakfasts. Given the cross-party support in this parliament, have you ever seen a government move so slowly? Where is the urgency? Let's reflect on the fact for a second that we now live in a Scotland where charities tell us that under the eligibility thresholds there are less young people entitled to free school meals than there were 20 years ago. Something has gone badly wrong. Or on reducing the cost of school uniform. Lots of words, but where has been the drive to change practice? Why are so many schools still encouraging branded items? It is not good enough to identify the problem after 15 years. You have to have shown some willing to actually do something about it. Perhaps if our education agencies weren't so weak and dysfunctional or our inspectorate was more rigorous, these messages might have got out there. Perhaps the central education teams at local authorities had the capacity beyond firefighting, they might have been able to work with schools on these types of issues. I could go on and on, but you start to see the pattern. For this SNP government, it's more important that things sound good in this chamber and that they are actually deliverable for those who need our education system the most. Yes, some things might have got better, but overall this last 15 years has been a period of stagnation at best and has ultimately seen decline. Under this SNP government, education has lost its sense of purpose. A toxic combination of botched attempts at radical reform and empty soundbites have taken precedence over a system that delivers for our young people. Vague notions of well-being are now more important than doing well. And under the Curriculum for Excellence, we see a methodology that serves those who would do well under any system, rather than a truly progressive, knowledge-based mindset that is ambitious for every young person. Education should help break down barriers and create opportunities. It should not be about lowering expectations. Too often, that is what this SNP government's approach looks like. And this does not hurt those who are well supported and resourced at home. They get a head start. This impacts most 
on those who come to school to learn. By cutting teacher numbers and limiting school resources, a deliberate choice is being made. Again, how any SNP minister can stand up in this chamber with a straight face and claim that teacher numbers are at the highest level since they started to cut them is beyond me. At least, I suppose, there has been some recognition uh, and admission that cutting school staff to the bone was the wrong thing to do. This was painfully exposed during the pandemic, and again, all of the evidence suggests it was our most vulnerable young people who once again paid the price. Rather than self-congratulatory rhetoric, maybe the Minister might start by apologising. Or can we take another issue? The funding received to support those in poverty in rural communities like my own Dumfrieshire constituency. Again, President Officer, I couldn't tell you how many times I have raised this issue in Parliament. Yet we continue to hear that the Government is always looking for better ways of doing things. The idea that there are no young people in poverty in some small rural schools in this country which receive no PEF funding is quite frankly absurd. Yes. Claire Hoggy. I thank the member for taking that intervention. I assume that Oliver Mundell isn't forgetting about many of the cruel social security cuts presided over by his colleagues in Westminster, including the recent cut of £20 to universal credit, which is resulting in more parents struggling to put food on the table and feed their children. Oliver Mundell. I, I'm not denying that there are challenges there, but Challenge. once again... Challenge. Once again, we're seeing the typical approach from this SNP government that rather than answer questions about the things they're responsible for, they'd rather talk about anything else. Um, and maybe, maybe if the Minister wants to intervene uh, and tell me if it's acceptable uh, that there are young people in poverty at some schools in our country who, under their current funding formula, don't receive uh, any additional funding, uh, then I'd be happy to take another intervention. Uh, but quite frankly, uh, telling us time and time again Yes. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the, of course, the funding package is around uh, free school meals. And also importantly, we're looking at uh, the number of children in low income families. If he does not agree with those measures of data about measuring poverty, particularly the number of children in low income families, which is specific, and the 97% of schools right across Scotland that get the pupil equity funding, if he disagrees with that, will he tell us uh, what uh, ratio he would like us to use for funding? Oliver Mundell. I, I thank the Minister for that intervention, but I go back to what she said earlier in the debate to my colleague Stephen Kerr, which is not all families uh, are taking up their eligibility. That's a starting point. I don't think that is a good problem to have. It's not a new problem, yes. and it's not, being it's not being created by universality. In rural communities, there are many young people who've gone without meals they're entitled to for years. And the Scottish Government should stop using that uh, as the model uh, for allocating funding. Uh, yes, it's welcome we've started looking at low-income families, but that does not apply to PEF funding. The Government could have made that change. They decided not to. And that's before we move on to the challenge of even getting to school in rural communities. Again, council budgets have been squeezed so hard. And the Government point us in the direction of local authorities' discretion. But what discretion does a local authority have to provide transport in rural areas uh, outside of the statutory mileage limits when they have no money to do so. Presiding officer, it all speaks to a lack of priority and an unwillingness to be upfront about the true scale of the challenge. And as I conclude, I think it is worth noting how today's debate only found time in the weeks ahead of the local government elections. If the issues set out today aren't enough to convince you of the lack of priority given to education under the SNP, then the amount of parliamentary time spared to discuss it certainly should. This is an SNP government that does little more than pretend it cares. Yes, there are lots of worthwhile initiatives, but we must remember they amount to absolutely nothing if they're not delivered. Until ministers deliver on their promises, they should stop coming to this chamber patting themselves on the back. They are responsible and Scotland's young people are being failed. Behind all the bluff and bluster, what do they really have to show for 15 years in power? Thank you, Ms Mundell. And I now call on Michael Mara to speak to and move Amendment 4138.1. Mr Mara. Thank you, President Officer. I happily move Labour's amendment in my name. Scottish Labour are absolutely committed to the removal of the barriers to the full experience of education 
for every family in Scotland. But teachers, head teachers, churches and school communities have long recognised these barriers and worked over many decades to help as many young people access school trips and extracurricular activities, which make a huge difference to their lives. It is absolutely right that good practice be adopted nationwide, and the government has a critical and key role to play in ensuring that is the case. We know that far too many significant barriers remain, uh, and there is a need for real poverty-sensitive policy in our schools. As the Child Poverty Action Group, and I think we should put on record uh, the much work that has been done by that group um, in recent years, so key to the development of the cost of the school day uh, policies, they have stated that the development of, development of poverty-sensitive school policies and practices reduced cost barriers, increased participation in school and after-school activities, reduced financial pressures and improved promotion and uptake of entitlements. Much to be celebrated. But further testimony quotes one parent of many that they spoke to. Times are hard when paying for the family home, food, childcare and general child costs. Parents just need to do without to ensure that the kids don't. And that is a common experience, I think, across Scotland, ever more so as bills increase and that household budgets are ever squeezed. And we know the cost of living crisis gets worse week by week and will con continue into the autumn when fuel prices will are set to rise again. But parents are regularly going without meals in Scotland to ensure that their children can keep their friendships as they see it. They can and that they can smile and they can feel like all the other kids. And that that is still necessary demands the kind of stopgap measures, because I believe that's what they are, outlined in the government motion. But they also demand that we talk about why they happen in the first place. Why work does not pay enough to make a decent life for a family. Why too many are locked out of employment. And why Scotland's economy continues to stagnate with chronically low levels of productivity, a yawning innovation gap, low levels of research and development, a paucity of technology uptake and key skills gaps in critical industries. But one crucial part of the solution, and it's detailed in Labour's motion today, is truly flexible wraparound childcare that is available and affordable. And the Minister had some words to say on that in her opening speech. But Labour's today, amendment today focuses not on what has happened or not happened, and I'll come on to that in a moment, but on what needs to be done next. If families continue to be locked out of the workplace because it does not make financial sense to work, given the absence or expense of childcare, then we have a system that is broken and in urgent need of repair. And the Cabinet Secretary had some warm words in those speech, um, and I am assuming that this is a kind of a preamble to saying we are already doing all the things that uh, Labour are asking for in their amendment. But after 15 years, they will be now be hearing the representations that we on these benches are hearing on a weekly basis from people who run nurseries, people who would love to have their kids in nurseries, families who can't take on the extra hours that they would be able to put money into the bank accounts to pay for many of the things they want for their children. And this requires a public published analysis of what is going on in our childcare sector, because they have been profoundly disrupted by the pandemic. And I regularly hear from those operators who are losing staff and are unable to replace them. So behaviour and working patterns have changed for a huge percentage of the population. That has to be recognised. But that is threatening the business models of current service providers as needs have shifted and changed in new ways. And Labour believes that urgent assessment is required of the health of the sector, and the Scottish Government should commission that work rather than having private conversations behind closed doors. So there is a significant impact, and let us be clear on this, on the most impoverished communities and families from the lack of that childcare, the lack of its availability, and the steadfast refusal of this Government to quantify the impact of the pandemic on the life chances of the poorest children in this country. So the list of inter interventions that the Government has uh, put together in this motion today is a list of words rather than real actions in many cases. Many of these initiatives have yet to be delivered, and the Cabinet Secretary shakes her head at that. Some are years away from being so, if they were ever be del delivered. Digital devices. We know how slow the rollout of that has been. We know, frankly, that digital devices were needed last year, more than ever. And we know that hundreds of thousands of them won't be delivered for years to come. The figures just mentioned today are seemingly an update to around 200, uh, 220,000 is approaching 30 per cent 
of the number that will be required. And at the moment, when, when uh, need has been greatest, it's frankly not good enough. So I've spoken with head teachers across Scotland who have used PEF money for these purposes to ensure that young people do not miss out, to upgrade the kinds of additional experiences that schools can, off can offer. So the cuts to central attainment funding this year of £27 million on last year shows the real priority the government gives to these efforts, the real, the real um, priority that, that they do in all of their spending plans. In answer to my intervention, there was no real justification, because this is a question of priorities. It's what do we think that money should be spent on? So we know that Audit Scotland said that very limited progress had been made to closing the attainment gap. We know the attainment gap is now at its greatest and largest level ever. The idea that that is the point at which you cut the money, that you do not find the additional resource from somewhere else to actually allow you to accelerate. Because if we go back onto the same track that we were on pre-pandemic, we are bound to fail, without any doubt, because the resource will not be there, most certainly. Cabinet Secretary. The figures do actually show that we were making progress in tackling poverty-related attainment gap before the pandemic. But I'm afraid Mr Mara's speech up until now um, has been a long list of demands of what the government should spend on. But at the budget, every single year, his party do not deliver any budgeted costing stats to be able to deliver this. So if there's any danger of warm words and little action, it's from the Labour Party who continue to demand the government does something. We are doing a lot on education. But the warm words and the demands from him are all a bit little. But, Michael Mara. I'm afraid, afraid to say the cabinet says it's entirely false. Labour provided costed budget proposals this year, as they had previous years. And we absolutely believe that education has to be a priority for investment in this parliament. It's the, the, question, the question has to be put to the Cabinet Secretary is why she was singularly unsuccessful in winning any arguments around the Cabinet table to get the investment in her portfolio. From early years to primary school, secondary school, the cuts to education in colleges and university. Every part of, of her portfolio screaming out loud, saying that she can't win the arguments that require to be won for our future. No, you've had your chance. Thank you very much. The Child Poverty, the child poverty Action Group have been behind so much of the policy drive. Thank you. Thank, well, please, come on. Cabinet Secretary. I will thank the member for, for giving way eventually. Investment in education is actually, from resource and capital spend in 2023, up almost £200 million. That is an increase. But if he does not think that that is satisfactory, where does he want it to come from in the rest of the Scottish Budget? Is it health? Is it justice? Where does it come from? Because once again, we are getting rhetoric and very little else. Michael Mara. I, th I think perhaps the, perhaps the Cabinet Secretary... Perhaps the Cabinet Secretary is deaf to the many of the other conversations that are going on in this, in, this, uh, in this chamber in recent weeks. Perhaps it could come from the grotesque waste that this government undertakes on a day-to-day -day basis. This party laid out last week £3 billion of waste from this, from this government in recent years. We look at the ferry scandal and the amount of money that has been poured down the drain. This government cannot... No, thank you, sir. This, this government cannot talk about the prudent... No, no thank you, sir. No, thank you. Officer, this government does not have a record where they can talk about the prudent management of fi the finances of this country and the responsible expenditure of taxpayers' money, because that is what it is. This funding was meant to help close the attainment gap, and it is £1 billion of taxpayers' money, and that gap is bigger than ever. And we have to remember the First Minister's personal defining mission, the top priority of this government. So just last week, we saw that as a cut to the poorest communities of attainment funding of 60%, the EIS had to say this, Cabinet Secretary. We have been absolutely appalled at the level of funding cuts at six of the original challenge authorities. It beggars belief as to why those cuts would be made at a time when poverty is rising and the pandemic has absolutely bludgeoned some communities. The EIS's words. School Leader Scotland said, we know the number of young people impacted by deprivation in these nine challenge areas. Surely it is immoral to take away that funding. The NESUWT said it's clearly not right to be making those swinging cuts, swinging cuts, and that will certainly have a negative impact in those areas. The Cabinet Secretary knows she has cut this money, 60%, for the most impoverished communities in Scotland, 79% in my home city of Dundee. And a former head teacher, a former head teacher in Dundee, saying that no, they have, he has no idea how Dundee can cope with a cut of over 100 posts, presiding officer. 
for those working with the most deprived. So this is the way that the funding works. It's critical to deliver more equal education. Why won't the Minister listen to these voices? Because it doesn't sound like she's listening to ours. Thank you, Mr Mara. And we will now move to the open debate. And I call Eleanor Whittam to be followed by Stephen Kerr. Ms Whittam. So it's standing up. Presiding officer, no young person should be unable to fully participate in their school life. No young person should lie awake worrying about finding money for dress down days, book sales and bake sales. No young person should be prevented from tuition and favourite subjects such as home economics or music due to family budget pressures. No child should miss school due to the stigma brought on by poverty and disadvantage. And no child should miss out on the excitement and the challenge of their school residential because the fee set is a mountain to climb itself. I remember my school days clearly and whilst most of those memories are fond, the time we were experiencing deep poverty when I was about eight is forever etched in my soul, despite those memories being the ones I would rather forget. I have already spoken in this place about the hunger, the food banks and the anxiety I had surrounding food insecurity, but I also remember clearly not having so much as a quarter to buy a cake at the many fundraising bake sales. I remember scouring the scholastic book leaflet that was popped into my school bag, earmarking all the books I would choose if money was not so tight. And I watched with envy, my cheeks burning with stigma and shame as the box of books arrived in the classroom and was unpacked with gleeful happy kids running up to fetch theirs when the teacher shouted their name. Even at that young age, I knew the pressures my parents were under and I hadn't even shown them the form, lest it make the whole situation worse. Kids in poverty make these decisions all of the time to protect themselves and their carers. I can also vividly remember my toes cramping at the front of my shoes as they began to pinch but not saying a word. Right now in our country, there are young people ignoring their pinched toes, crumpling up and hiding away their book form, feigning a sore belly on yet another non-uniform day, and dreaming of a P7 school res residential they know they won't be able to attend. Deputy Presiding Officer, we know that this is damaging for the well-being of our young folk, and we all know that this adds to the poverty-related attainment gap. When you spend your life worrying as a small child about money and food, you will often struggle to focus on anything else, including your lessons. This is why reducing the cost of the school day for low-income families is crucial. And while rec and recognising the ongoing work across national and local government and third sector partners in this area is key, and I welcome the Cabinet Secretary's recommitment to delivering on our priority policies. According to the Child Poverty Action Group, who have pioneered this work in their cost of the school day programme, removing cost barriers at school helps to build the right foundations and conditions for better participation, well-being and attainment. Boosting incomes through access to financial entitlements helps to support families in the here and the now and contributes to the wider national mission of ending child poverty. An independent evaluation of the cost of the school day programme found that these approaches can support increased understanding of child poverty, the development of poverty-sensitive school policies and practices, reduce cost barriers, increase participation in school and after-school activities, reduce financial pressures and improve promotion and uptake of entitlements. As a member of the party of government, I am proud that we have created the Scottish Child Payment and I am glad that our budget decisions ensured that we will be increasing it to £25 per week per child. This money is vital to help those families facing the worst effects of the Tory cost of living crisis and who will have experienced the worst cut to welfare and living memory. I know that the opposition may say that the uplift was only ever to be temporary. But when every penny is a prisoner and that extra 20 quid a week meant not a trip, a trip to the food bank, having it snatched away again only results in further poverty and debt. It's not like a banker's bonus. It's not a wee, nice wee bung. This made a huge difference to families and its removal was cruel. Our welcome decision to mitigate the UK Tory benefit cap, including the hated rape clause, will also mean that those larger families who were plunged into absolute poverty will see a marked improvement to their finances. My own SNP-led local authority area in East Ayrshire, where I'm still a councillor for exactly 10 more days, is making great strides in reducing the cost of the school day in a number of ways with our Poverty Proofing Our Establishments programme, which uses innovative ideas to help families, including everything from using the PEF funding for something like a school steamy, where the entire community has access to clothes washing facilities to free breakfast clubs and reducing hunger and food waste by packaging up surplus school food for children to help themselves to on the way out the door, on the way home from school. 
Many schools are also holding clothing swaps as it's recognised children don't just grow over the summertime. Children continue to grow right throughout the year. I don't have time, sorry, I normally would. Um, we have ensured that free period products are also available in multiple locations, but these can also be ordered and delivered straight to the home for all via an online form. And we've made great strides in allocating digital devices and connectivity to ensure pupils have the tools they need for learning. If you listen to everybody else in this place today, you'd think that no child has received a laptop nor the connectivity that they need. Holiday times can be very hard for families, and we've ensured that we have school meal provision coupled with access to free activities and outings. A very simple and yet effective tool has been the move towards automatic awards for free school meals and clothing grants to reduce the stigma of the application process and to increase uptake. And I think we all recognise right across the chamber that increasing uptake is vital and that we need to make sure that we do it. But do remember, over three quarters of families are already in receipt um, of the Scottish Child Payment. Presiding officer, these measures set out in the government's motion, I don't have time, sorry, um, complement the wide range of policy initiatives, including in the Scottish Government's Child Poverty Strategy for Scotland, to maximise household resources and improve children's wellbeing and life chances. I'm sure we can all agree that this has never been more important as costs soar and family budgets are squeezed like never before. All of our children deserve a supportive and nurturing school environment free from money worries. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Stephen Kerr to be followed by Paul McLennan. Mr Kerr. Eleanor Whitten has pointed out that the SNP promised every child in Scottish schools a free device and a free internet connection, and they're failing to deliver that. So um, you know, I've always believed that education is the best tool for social empowerment. It's one of our country's greatest achievements that taxpayers fund education for every child that calls here home, a privilege that many millions of children around the world do not enjoy as a right. And as has been highlighted by the contributions already made, taxpayer-funded education does not instantly create equal opportunities within our education system. And as a Conservative, creating equal opportunities for every child, regardless of family income, can succeed is, is at the heart of my politics. But also at the heart of my politics is pragmatism. And it is correct to remind ourselves that creating equality of opportunity will not occur with one policy idea alone. There must be a wide range of policies, and three of which I intend to address briefly in my speech. First, we must raise the standard of education across our schools. We don't create equality of opportunity by lowering standards in Scottish education. Professor Lindsay Patterson has said that available data shows that low-status students do well in England as well as in Scotland, while high-status students do better in England. He goes on, it would thus be highly disingenuous to say that only that inequality in Scotland is falling and is less than in England. Inequality also fell in England, mainly by raising the low-status students while also raising high-status students. Scotland raised low-status students by less and depressed high-status students. It would not be reasonable, he says, to describe this as better progress towards equality of outcome in Scotland than in England. And I know it's a comparison the SNP love to make all the time. The SNP have run out of ideas to improve education standards in Scotland. While well, they offer slogans and expensive promises, international league tables and the increasing attainment gap show the continuous decline of Scottish education on the SNP's watch. Rather than believe that more bureaucracy is the answer to our problems, the Scottish Conservatives want to restore the values that made Scottish education the envy of the world. We want to empower teachers in the classroom, allowing them to decide what approach is best for pupils in their school. Second, we must ensure that support is made available to the poorest families and that that support reaches them. Just yesterday, meeting with teachers from schools in the Western Partnership area, I was forcibly reminded that that support is not getting to the families that most need it. Those who most need the help are often the ones not accessing it. Yes, I will. Clear, Holly. Taking the intervention, and I hear what he's saying about um, targeting uh, money to low-income families, but does he also recognise that many of the actions that this Scottish Government takes to support low-income families, for example, increasing the Scottish Child Payment, is simply undermined by his colleagues at Westminster when they raise benefits by 3 per cent 
and when they cut universal credit. Stephen Kerr. The minister, the minister may not like it, but we're here today examining the record of the Scottish Government. And I know that you all love to talk about the Tory Government at Westminster, but we're actually here to hold the Scottish Government to account. Now, not only is there a problem with accessing, accessing support, but there's an issue even with eligibility, as has been mentioned by my colleague. According to Aberlour, fewer children are eligible for free school meals today in Scotland than 20 years ago. In 2002, low-income working families with an income of just over £13,000 were eligible for free school meals. Today, that income threshold is little more than £16,000. Adjusted for inflation, however, the income threshold from two decades ago would be the equivalent of around £22,000 in 2021. To ensure that the families that need support get support, the Scottish Conservatives are committed to introducing free school breakfasts and lunches for all primary school children. And why the government, with such cross-party support in this place for such a measure, doesn't make haste is completely beyond my reckoning. I'll take a in, from the Cabinet Secretary first. Cabinet Secretary. The practical points about why um, we need to provide capital expenditure for local authorities is if we actually increased free school meals for primary six and seven at this point, well, there's not the catering facilities available. What we would have in areas is actually a cold lunch being provided that isn't actually as good as the hot lunch, which, thanks to the cuts in welfare down Westminster, is likely to be sometimes the only hot meal a child will get. So we would have actually seen a diminution in the quality, which is why we're ensuring that we're taking our time to get this right, capital and revenue expenditure working together to provide that. Stephen Kerr. The Cabinet Secretary once again betrays her obsession with blaming other people for the lack of progress her government makes in measures where there is cross-party support in this chamber. And during the school holidays, we also support the provision of free school meals for eligible families. We would ensure that the income threshold is adjusted to take inflation into account. Third, we must create the economic conditions for family incomes to rise across Scotland. Research published yesterday by the Scottish Trade Unions Congress, an unlikely ally, you must, I must admit, found that the average take-home pay for Scots is the lowest compared with the rest of the United Kingdom. The SNP have presided over a low-growth, low-wage economy since 2007, and last year went into coalition with the Greens who do not even support the concept of economic growth. Can I take one more? Yes, briefly, please, uh, Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Stephen Kerr, for taking intervention. Would Stephen Kerr tell me which parliament actually controls employment legislation? Stephen Kerr. The economy I'm talking about, Stuart McMillan, the economy. And the reality is you can't escape your economic record. You have delivered a low-growth, low-wage economy. You've been in power for 15 years. You've made a coalition with a party that doesn't even accept the concept of economic support. Make no bones about it. Economic growth is about good jobs, well-paid jobs, for people to be able to support themselves and their families. And the Scottish Conservatives believe that there must be a change in the Scottish Government's attitude and approach, moving past slogans and self-congratulatory motions to build a high-growth, high-wage economy. To do this, the Scottish Conservatives want to create an environment where Scotland is at the forefront of innovation, the forefront of enterprise, skills, vocational development and business opportunity by creating the right economic conditions to increase pay throughout Scotland. Families will have more money in their pocket and keep more of their money after tax, helping them with not only the cost of the school day, but all the bills that families throughout Scotland face to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, I am sure the Scottish Conservatives will work with every party in this chamber to help families with the cost of the school day. But we will approach this pragmatically, knowing there is not only one solution. We need a fundamental shift in how we approach this question, with greater emphasis being placed on raising broad educational standards and building a high-skill and high-wage economy. Thank you, Mr Kerr. I now call Paul McLennan to be followed by Pam Duncan Glancy. Mr McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. How can I follow that? Uh, this is a, an incredibly important debate at a time where the cost of living crisis is impacting us all. Now, there are many things that make me proud to call Scotland my home. I welcome approach to old Scots and new 
A role as a progressive nation is bringing with innovation and confident of its role in this world. It is my privilege every day representing my local area East Lothian in our national parliament and have an opportunity to discuss issues that mean so much to those people who live in the constituency. One of the most important issues I have had the chance to debate and lead, changing my role as a member of the Scottish Parliament, is ensuring that Scotland is the best place in the world for children to grow up. A passion of mine that I know is shared by across all the different benches in the Chamber and, of course, is a priority of our Scottish Government. It is because of this shared passion that this very Chamber unanimously passed the UNCRC Bill, which sought to incorporate the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child into Scots law. Indeed, if we had not been constitutionally prohibited from enacting such legislation, we could have had enshrined and fully protected the rights of our children in domestic law. Article 28 of the UNCRC says that children and young people have the right to education no matter who they are. Of course, um, I want to get more into the, 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 my, uh, the speech at the moment, Mr Kerr, I'll maybe take one later on. Of course, all children in Scotland are afforded this right free of charge. This educational journey begins when the majority of Scottish children start, usually start school, usually between the ages of four and five and a half. It is in primary schools that our children experience the majority of their formative years. Given our children their first experience of formal learning, which can influence the route that they take throughout the education system and their success within it, is undeniable. But primary schools are very important places in a child's life. Secondary schools, of course, represent the next chapter in our children's lives. A place where they meet new people, have the opportunity to learn more than they ever have, and experience new experiences and develop from teenagers into young adults before entering the world. At every stage of Scotland's children's lives, our schools have a huge impact, both positive and negative, on the people our children become and strive to be. So why is this important, uh, this debate, uh, uh, important uh, today? Well, it is important because we have the majority of Scottish children are given the same opportunity to attend school, the school experience and, indeed, the cost of the school day impacts Scotland, eh, children across Scotland very differently. Yes, on the face of it, education in, in Scotland is free, but there are often hidden and extra costs that can act as a barrier to participation in school. As we all know, school costs can put pressure on low-income families and put children and young family at risk of missing out on opportunities and feeling different, ashamed and stigmatised. And, and we heard from Elena Whitton's speech in, in that regard. I can remember the same kind of feelings as well, and I can remember kids at, at school, going through school myself, the same thing. Uniforms, trips, school lunches, gym kits, pencils and pens, dress down days can be difficult to afford for low-income families. There's one in four children in Scotland uh, in poverty, which works out around about 5,000 children in East Lothian. The scale of poverty related stigma that some children in our schools may experience should not be underestimated. The universal credit cuts affected 8,000 families in East Lothian alone. So taking lessons from the Conservatives are in about the support for families, uh, no thanks. The poverty related stigma is combined with the very real reality for our families with school aged children. Costs associated with in and out of school activities can place a significant burden on financial resources and increase the cost of living even further. And of course, in recent years, COVID 19 has magnified already a greater risk of poorer educational outcomes and well being, increased barriers to uh, engagement, and reduced participation in school life associated with growing up in poverty. And we have had extensive debate in this chamber about the cost of living crisis we are already living through right now. Skyrocketing energy prices are impacting families in the lowest income in our, lowest, in our local areas. In my own constituency, I am witnessing the number of food bank parcels given across the county, doubling on a month-to-month -month basis. Last month alone, it is 104 per cent year-on-year. Schools cannot eradicate child poverty alone. It is for that reason that the Scottish Government has plans for an entire suite of measures that can prevent and mitigate the effects of poverty. A doubling of the Scottish child payment to £20 a week, and with the intention of going up to £25 a week, of course, is one example of this. That, um, I don't have much time, President Officer. Well, there is a wee bit of time in hand if yep. the member wishes yep. to take the intervention. Yep. Pam Duncan Glancy. Okay. Thank you, Deputy President Officer, and I thank the member for taking the intervention. Would you also welcome the doubling of the Scottish Child Payment for, for children on bridging payments? Uh, Paul McLennan. We, yeah, I, I know the members raised that before. Of course, they do, and I think that obviously the, the Cabinet Secretary and or the Minister will pick that up in, in their summing up. Schools and education services can do their, their bit to face up to child poverty by tackling the cost of school day in partnership with other services. So obviously, that will impact the impact of the quality and health, well-being and learning outcomes being experienced by our children. And of course, the extension of free school meals to all primary school children aged pupils and the recently announced £1 billion, fund, uh, £1 billion funding of the government to close the poverty attainment gap over this parliamentary term will make a huge difference alongside these local solutions. Yep. Stephen yep. Kerr. Does the member recognise that there is a problem, as has been mentioned previously in this debate, 
with getting the people that need the support, the support, that support, in terms of accessing it? Does he acknowledge that? And is that something to perhaps that across the parties we could work on, despite his earlier comment about my party and our interest in the welfare of families? Paul McLennan. I think the universal credit point, but I think the point that you make, uh, Mr Kerr, is very relevant, because I think there is still that stigma that's attached, and I think we've all got a role as MSPs and, and working with the local authorities to break down that, that, that stigma that exists. So that, there is an issue around that, but we all have a role uh, to do that. I think we've learned from the Cabinet Secretary as well around about the, the wraparound care and the intentions and plans for, for that. We need to level up the playing field for children and striving for an education system that has pupil equity through. It's no doubt a goal for all of us, regardless of where we come from in the Chamber. President Officer, I'll finish with this key point. An equal access to learning and opportunities at school means an equal outcomes for our children. It's crucial that every child is able to make the most of their school day. The Scottish Government is helping making this happen in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McLennan. I now call Pam Duncan Glancy to be followed by Co Cab Stewart. Ms Duncan Glancy. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Just last month, the Scottish Government published the second Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan. We on these benches recognise the action taken to date, but share concerns of many organisations that whilst it did contain some good ideas, most of these were little more than that, ideas presented without plans or actions. And despite whatever the Government has done to date, experts still say that, and only on a good day, we might just scrape through the relative poverty target, and that we will most definitely miss three out of four of the other child poverty targets. Deputy President Officer, that means that this time next year, 120,000 children will still live in absolute poverty, unable to pay for their very basic needs. It is clear that the actions of this Government right now are not enough. Warm words won't pay bills. If they don't pick up pace and scale, hundreds of thousands of children in Scotland will be on a path to destitution. And this grim reality is only the tip of the iceberg. It gets worse when we look at priority families. The Government's failure to provide targeted support to those families also means that households with a disabled person in them, single parent families and black minority ethnic families face disproportionately high levels of deprivation and the Child Poverty Plan does little for them. Deputy President Officer, this is about children and human rights. An adequate standard of living is a right under the Human Rights Act, the UNCRC and the UNCRPD, yet tens of thousands of children are yet not able to, to realise these. These treaties also protect our right to education, and I am proud to live in a country where that education is free, and thanks to previous Scottish Labour and Liberal Democrat administrations here in Scotland, that continues all the way to university. But just because every child has a place at school does not mean that each child is able to enjoy that experience equally. Children cannot learn when they are hungry. That is why our cost of living package backed money in people's pockets. It is why we asked the Government to make the Scottish Child Payment £40 in April next year and called on them to do more for those on low incomes and those in the squeezed middle. Neither the Tories in Westminster nor the SNP in Scotland have done enough to mitigate the effects of rising fuel, food and fuel prices. They have ignored our calls and families are buckling under the pressure. For people living in poverty, or even those just about managing to stay afloat, the costs of going to school and fully realising the right to education are, for too many, rights that they cannot afford. Third sector organisations are doing their best to step up and plug gaps, providing hardship funds to those that have no one else to turn, and I thank them for their incredible work this and every year. Organisations like Aberlour have given out £1.5 million to over 6,000 people to help them cover basic necessities. But the truth is, it should not be down to them. Uniform, a school bag, a pencil case, a stationery, indoor shoes and outdoor shoes, lunches, travel to get there. These are the basics. And whilst there are initiatives, including some government ones, in place to help with some of these, like free school meals and pre-loved uniform and kit banks, using them often comes with stigma felt by parents and their children. They do not reach everyone or work for everyone either. There are families who just miss out on school, free school meals who are unable to pay the rate of a basic daily meal, never mind including extra for additional treats that other children can afford. With the rising cost of living and increasing food prices, those who were just about managing to provide packed lunches are now struggling to do so, at least to the nutritional standards that children in need. And too often, children are even hiding their lunchboxes or eating separately from their friends to hide what they have got or not got. These initiatives make children feel different, less than their peers, sometimes by their peers. It doesn't have to be like that. Reducing stigma in, in, is crucial, and it's possible. Many schools operate a card-based system where children can either top up their card online or with cash, with people on free school meals automatically receiving credit, meaning they and their friends use the exact same method of payment at the front of the lunch queue. 
No child should be handed a letter, chasing them for debts or, paying unable, or being una unable to pay for their lunch. Interactions with schools and payments processes should all be with via parents. Schools and local authorities should be reaching out to parents, establishing where support is needed and offering it. And hard-working teachers and, and school staff know how to do this. They know their pupils well. They are a line of defence against children going hungry. Collaborative working is vital to ensure that when parents are struggling, the school can point them in the right direction for additional support via local authorities, citizens' advice bureaus and third sector organisations in a way that is not judgmental or stigmatising. But the more that school, council and third sector budgets are cut, the harder it is to do that and to support families. Furthermore, schools that mandate specific uniforms and PE kits from particular suppliers should really consider changing to a more flexible and generic approach, making it easier for parents to look for cost-sensitive options. One school in my region demands a uniform that costs almost £100 an outfit, while others are more flexible, meaning parents can easily pick up much cheaper alternatives. And lastly, school trips, clubs, special celebrations and events, the favourites of which I am sure many of us can recount fill many families with dread and these arise, as these arise in the school calendar. For some, they are simply unthinkable. Budget restraints facing school means that more and more children are having to pay to attend or cover supplies at extracurricular clubs. Families see their children missing out as they watch others participate in these experiences with no feasible ways of doing so themselves. Trips to parks, museums, libraries and leisure facilities are, of course, a good alternative. But that is only possible while these places are open and accessible. And I know only too well, in my own region of Glasgow, the diminishing council budgets mean that these places are the first to be cut and the, op uh, the options available are not there for schools. Places like the People's Palace are a prime example. And I hope that Glasgow City Council will pledge to ensure that it is never again forced to close its doors. Deputy Presiding Officer, the cost of the school day is too often a hidden cost, but the effects of it are not. Not properly considering it when we celebrate the right to freedom of education leaves children to face stigma and prejudice made to feel different. Just as children cannot learn when they are hungry, they cannot learn to their full potential when they feel judged or stigmatised. We do not need miracles to change this. We need innovation, proper funding for councils, money in people's pockets and real action to tackle child poverty and the cost of living crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Duncan Clancy. I now call Kokab Stewart to be followed by Ross Greer. Ms Stewart. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I am delighted to speak in this debate, reflecting on the many vital actions that are being taken by the Scottish Government to reduce the cost of the school day for uh, children from low-income families. And I do welcome the Scottish Government's recognition that this state of affairs is totally unacceptable. Uh, the motion does demonstrate its commitment to ensuring that children can participate fully in all aspects of school life without additional financial costs. Education should, of course, be free for all children. As a teacher of 30 years' experience in the classroom, I have seen the impact on the left-out child of not being able to go to the Christmas fair and being left in the classroom because they do not have a ticket, not having the 30 pence to adopt the soft toy, the, thoughtless, uh, the thoughtfulness of teachers giving their own money to children to enable them to buy the popcorn or guess how many sweets there are in a jar. In fact, teachers, in collaboration with parent councils, have long been aware of the need to ensure that no child is excluded. And I'm sure we all remember participating in sponsored walks and asking friends and family to contribute. Perhaps some of us would have uh, provided more benefit by taking part in sponsored silences. Not wanting to come across as a total Ms Trunchbull, I do accept uh, and believe that these activities are a vital component of the school day and calendar. They contribute to the school and wider community in so many fun ways. And of course, all children should participate fully, but without experiencing the stigma of not having the financial resource. The Child Poverty Action Group's Cost of the School Day campaign focuses on raising awareness of disproportionate and hidden costs from dress down days to dress up days, charity support days and other fundraising events. It also highlights the cost of basic necessities such as stationery, uniform, food and transport. 
It provides a wealth of creative ways to school to, uh, for a school to identify and tackle these costs. And I myself participated in the pilot training programme in Glasgow. And not only did it challenge my own assumptions, but also led to the school a uh, wide re-evaluation of the school calendar events in order to cut out any additional expenses placed on children and families. The Scottish Government has quite rightly committed substantial funds to address the cost of the school day, including uniform, meals, transport. The school uniform grant currently stands at £120 per eligible uh, primary child and at £150 per eligible secondary young person. Uh, £11.8 million of additional funding has been provided to local authorities to enable this. All children from P1 to P5 and eligible children in P6 and 7 have been in receipt of free school lunches since January. And I welcome that provision will be extended to all children in primary and special schools during the course of this Parliament. It should be noted the policy of providing universal free school meals saves all families an average of £400 per child per year. Child poverty levels in Scotland are six percentage points below the UK average, standing at 24%, compared to 30% in England, 31% in Wales, and of course matching Northern Ireland at the 24%. Child poverty in Scotland is projected to fall to its lowest level in nearly 30 years as a result of the actions taken by the Scottish Government to date and commitments in the second Tackling Child Poverty Delivery Plan. Other, uh, I'll just crack, I'm nearly done. <laughs> Other examples of game-changing Scottish Government action on child poverty include doubling the child payment to £20, increasing it to £25, extending it to all children in low-income families up to the age of 16 by the end of this year. And the Child Poverty Action Group has reported that uh, the cost of bringing up a child in Scotland will be reduced by 31% or nearly £24,000 a year once the child, uh, Scottish child payment is doubled and the expansion of free school meals provision is fully delivered. However, these actions are being taken in the face of UK Tory government, which seems to be determined to increase inequality instead of reducing it. And of course, the Scottish government is trying to deal with this issue with one hand tied behind its back. Inequality is a blight on Scotland, and actually, it's a blight on the whole of the UK. The difference here is that in Scotland, we have a government that understands this and takes action to address it. I therefore welcome this motion, and even Miss Honey, I think, would defer to the words of Kofi Annan. There is no duty more important than ensuring that their rights are respected, that their welfare is protected, that their lives are free from fear and want, and that they can grow up in peace. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Ms Stewart. I now call Ross Greer to be followed by Bob Doris. Mr Greer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Too often we talk about education as the route out of poverty and the great leveller between people of different backgrounds. It clearly has a huge role to play, but those kind of statements are often made without any acknowledgement of the wider structural inequalities in society, which mean even the most academically gifted, high-achieving young person from a disadvantaged background is likely to be disadvantaged for the rest of their life compared to their peers from far more affluent backgrounds, even if they achieved far less in terms of qualifications at school. This is the line of argument which leads us to treating teachers and school support staff as something between a social worker and a miracle worker, expected to cure all the societal injustices which too many children and young people enter the classroom each morning already suffering as a result of. We can't eradicate poverty through our schools. Whatever policies we adopt and however much money we spend there, and it would be desperately unfair to already overwhelm school staff, not to mention children and their families, if we were to try to do so. But schools do have a really important role in a wider holistic plan to tackle and eliminate child poverty. At the very least, the policies and support mechanisms should be in place to stop them from actually making inequality worse. This is something the EIS have produced excellent resources on in recent years, and I would strongly recommend their poverty-proofing schools packs to every school and council in the country. 
This objective of poverty proofing our schools and reducing the cost of the school day is at the heart of the Scottish Government's agenda, and in particular the Butte House Agreement reached last year by the Greens and the SNP. Capping the cost of school uniforms via statutory guidance, for example, is a policy I was proud to take from the Scottish Greens manifesto into the programme for government. Across far too many schools and council areas, there are unnecessarily prescriptive uniform requirements and exclusive agreements with certain suppliers, which only serve to drive up the cost of uniforms, putting greater burden on low income and on larger families. Parliament's Education Committee took extensive evidence on this in the last session, with examples of mandatory blazers with unnecessary braiding, needlessly specific PE uniforms, and other policies which were, and still are, harming some of the most vulnerable families in those school communities. Yes. Martin Whitfield. I'm very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm very grateful to the member um, giving way. Would he also confirm that that should also extend to the protective PE sports equipment that exists, without which it would be dangerous for children to participate in some sports, and it often gets missed out in this discussion? Ross Greer. <clears throat> I think that's a really important point. I have to say I wasn't the sporty one in my family, but uh, I know that my brother would certainly uh, strongly agree with those sentiments, and my parents, with the, the cost of providing for my brother's enthusiasm for every sport under the sun, uh, would certainly agree with that. And as we get to the point of scoping out that statutory guidance, I think that is a really important point to make. Increasing the school clothing grant is, of course, a welcome step in this area, particularly now in the context of rising inflation. But in and of itself, it could never be the solution. Without creating statutory guidance to cap the cost of school uniforms in the first place, the uniform grant would amount to an ever-increasing subsidy to the companies producing these unnecessarily expensive uniforms. So I'm looking forward to the production of this guidance and the opportunities it provides us to tackle many other inequalities that the Cabinet Secretary mentioned, for example, around the financial impact on young women and girls of needlessly gendered uniform policies. The expansion of free school meals is another cornerstone policy in this agenda. Universal free meals in primary school was first agreed as part of the last budget deal between the Greens and the SNP in the previous session of Parliament. And despite the challenges of the pandemic, its rollout does continue. Every child in primary one through five has access to a free meal at school, with primary six and seven following as soon as possible. I understand completely the calls for this rollout to be sped up. That was the Scottish Government's original plan. But COSA quite fairly said they needed more time and money to make the necessary changes to school kitchens and other facilities to meet an increased level of demand. That funding has been provided this year. There's £35 million in capital funds. So I hope the expansion to all primary year groups can now take place as quickly as possible. Yes. Paul O'Kane. I thank Ross Greer for taking the intervention. Does he accept, however, in larger authorities where there is an expanding school population, such as East Ramshire and Eastern Bartonshire, there will be a requirement for further capital funding to ensure that school lunch times can actually be provided within the timescales? I am thinking in particular of Merns Primary and Newton Merns, for example, where there are upwards of 1,500 pupils to be fed over a lunch time. Ross Greer. I am grateful uh, for the member for that intervention. I agree absolutely. The need in each local authority is not exactly the same, and particularly in the local authorities with growing populations like the two that the member and I both represent that have just been mentioned, there is a need for continued funding to make sure that this is available. One other area which has made it from the Scottish Greens manifesto into the government's programme is the expansion of family income maximisation services attached to schools. Because for all the other important initiatives through which we support low-income families, the single most effective thing which can be done to help, which gives families the most dignity and respect, is to increase their income. The Healthier Welfare Children programme, run by NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, is an excellent example of this. It has been running since October 2010, and as of August 2020, the financial gain for families was estimated at £36.5 million from 27,000 referrals. That is an average of £1,350 going to families who were entitled to it, but for whatever reason were not already accessing it. I know that similar schemes have seen similar levels of success in other areas. The Butte House Agreement will see funding for family income maximisation services increased by £10 million over this session. That will not all take place through schools, but they play a cr critical role because schools are often, not always, but often, the only route through which some families have a trusting relationship with the state. Despite the wide range of measures listed in this motion and the others the Government is undertaking, it is entirely right for those such as the Child Poverty Action Group and the Scottish Youth Parliament to push for this work to go further and faster. And I can see that point made in Labour's amendment this afternoon. That is exactly what the Government is constantly asking of itself. Just look at the new Child Poverty Delivery Plan, which commits to a further increase in the Scottish Child Payment to £25 and action to mitigate the UK Government's cruel benefit gap, another Green Manifesto commitment which I am proud to see implemented. Eradicating child poverty is a mission which unites all of us in this Parliament and, with the caveats I mentioned earlier, schools have a critical role to play in that effort. 
The Government's agenda is ambitious, but I am glad to see a collective desire for us to go further, and I look forward to discussions about how exactly we do that in the months ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Greer. And before I call the next speaker, could I remind all those members who are hoping to speak in the debate to ensure that their cards are in and that the request to speak buttons are pressed. And I now call Bob Doris to be followed by Pam Gozel. Mr Doris. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to speak in this debate regarding reducing the cost of school day for low-income families. There is a swathe of direct interventions that have been made by this SNP government to help low-income families. The newly doubled Scottish Shell payment, for instance, together with the three Best Start grant payments, those being, of course, the pregnancy and baby payment, early learning payment and school age payment, together with Best Start Foods. That is worth over £10,000 to low-income families by the time their first child turns six. Could I also point out, President Officer, that uh, we saw today that if you qualify for the Scottish Shell payment, the Scottish Government will now automate payments for early learning payments and school age payments, and that is a significant progress also. It is worth noting that the difference of more than £8,200 for every eligible child born in Scotland compared to similar initiatives in England and Wales, that is a real difference. And of course, we want and must do more in Scotland. And this debate has been outlining some of the ways the Scottish Government intends to, to do that, and we are also hearing some other suggestions, and that is right also. However, I have a very cynical reason for comparing the Scottish Government's priorities for low-income families to those of the UK Government in particular. And it is not to make a party political point. I think it is self-evident, President Officer, Scotland's ambitions, plans, priorities and resourcing decisions go far beyond anything the UK Government is doing. Indeed, there is much cross-party support for SNP plans, and I think the nature of the Labour Amendment suggests that. I will say more a little bit about that later. The debate has moved on in Scotland from questioning universal free school meals to questioning universal free prescriptions and to questioning free access to universal higher education. Labour once described that as a something-for-nothing society. The debate has now moved on dramatically, and I welcome Labour coming on board with the SNP in relation to that. When compared to the devastatingly harmful and retrograde steps by the UK Government's decisions to withdraw £20 universal credit uplift, a decision which has hammered some of our most vulnerable and struggling households, it is clear that together we have set together across party, we have set different, more progressive path forward for Scotland. I want to compare the decision taken here in Scotland with Westminster because I want to urge Westminster to take a similar approach. Not only would that benefit English families in England with, with initiatives that I suggest to the tune of an additional £8,300 for every child by the time they turn six, but because of the way Scotland is financed via Barnet consequentials, it would release another £225 million of Scotland's own money to reinvest in these initiatives and do further to tackle child poverty and the cost of the school day. That is by dint of the way Scotland is financed. We need England to adopt these policies also so Scotland can go further. I am proud of the priorities set and achievements secured by the Scottish Government. On a cross-party basis, I have to say, President Officer, and much of these have been targeted at those in the lowest incomes. However, I want to reflect on the Scottish Government's policy in relation to the important universal approach, an increasingly universal approach, with the provision of universal free school meals. In 2015, the Scottish Government delivered universal free school meals for P1 to P3. By January this year, it is extended right up to the end of P5 pupils. And before the end of this parliamentary session, it will be all children in primary school. I should put on record, I see the natural ending place, universal free school meals, irrespective of school setting for children, quite frankly. But that will go beyond this parliament, I suspect. Of course, there is also the addition to the targeted approach of free school meals for other children out with the groups who will qualify universally. The scale of the universal provision should not be underestimated. 274,000 children between P1 and P5 are automatically registered to qualify for free school meals if they take up the offer, of course, Mr Kerr, which I accept is, is an issue we, we should look at. That, that is an investment of over £95 million for the Scottish Government to provide universal free school meals. But it is also more than that. It is about tackling stigma. Yes, there is the cost of the school day, but there is the cost of stigma within the school day and the impact that has, that has 
on education. It is about the right to a school meal, not because you are poor, but because you're, you have the right as a young person to have a free, nutritious school meal in the first place. A dignified approach and a key child welfare approach. I rarely make personal contributions in this chamber because I am in a privileged position, including with my income, but I remember very well my experience in the 1980s. Uh, with, my, with my experience of free school meals being at the end of the queue if you lost your dinner ticket. I also remember selling my dinner ticket so I knew what it was like to have cash in my pocket for the first time ever. The Scottish child payment dramatically impacts on that and the quality of life for young people living in poverty. But I hate mentioning these things because I am now in a privileged position, presiding officer, quite frankly. Uh, the Labour amendment gives us a, a nod to universality regarding uh, universally available summer clubs. Much good work is going on in this area already for the last five years in Glasgow Council, run by the SNP, regarding its holiday hunger programme. And in Maryhill and Springburn, the constituents that I represent, presiding officer, this summer coming in Codder, in Royston, in Somerset, in Lamhill, in Ruckhill, in Milton, in Wineford, in Maryhill, and I will continue, presiding officer, in Springburn, in Postal Park, in Parkhouse, and in Wester Common, are all individual sites where there will be summer clubs running with free access to food for all who want to come along and take part in the activities there, run by the third sector, and it will be hugely the successful. Do I have time? No, the members bring his remarks to a close, I believe. Okay. Well, in that case, I, I apologise to Pam Duck and Glancy. In closing, I will say that I think there is more consensus in this debate than we may realise, and I'm pleased to depart on it as we work together commonly. Uh, jointly to reduce the cost of the school day for all the young people that we represent. Thank you, Mr Torres. And I now call Pam Gozer to be followed by Evelyn Tweed. Ms Gozer. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am grateful to be contributing to this important debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives and express my support for the amendment made by my colleague Oliver Mundell. We often come into this chamber and judge the performance of our education system based on attainment. But rarely do we get a chance to discuss the factors which make attainment possible. And for the hours spent in school to be worthwhile and effective, pupils' only concern should be learning. And I find it rather distressing hearing accounts of children from low-income families who have left and felt embarrassed, stressed, ashamed or outcast during their time at school due to their financial circumstances. And I fear... Claire Hawkey. Thank you very much uh, to Pam Gosal for taking my intervention. And I hear what she's saying about she feels distressed about hearing about children whose lives are impacted by poverty. Will she join me in condemning her Tory counterparts at Westminster who have imposed that poverty on many of the children and families in Scotland. Pam Gosling. I thank the member for your intervention. However, I think it was said earlier on, the SNP Scottish Government need to stop hiding behind the UK Government. I mean, we are talking about failures here that were mentioned earlier on. It is not just the ferry fiasco that you threw money away on. We are talking about the malicious prosecution of Rangers. We are talking about the hospitals. We are talking about money here that could be spent. Excuse me, I am speaking. Money that could be spent today on issues that were so important to our children. Ms Gosal, hold on a second. Could the front benches please stop having a slang in match while Ms Gosal is trying to speak? Ms Gosal. Thank you, presiding officer. And I fear that recently announced changes to funding for the Scottish Attainment Challenge will result in further examples of this in my region. The changes to the Attainment Gap Funding Model will see pupil equity funds cut by around 850,000 per year by 2025 for West and Bartonshire, a council with the fourth highest level of child poverty in the country. In fact, an analysis by Audit Scotland published in 2021 shows that when you exclude Attainment Scotland funds, spending on education in nearly all Attainment Challenge areas fell from 2013 
to 2019. This money can be crucial in helping cover the cost of the school day for pupils from disadvantaged backgrounds. So we continue to disagree with the reduction in key funding for attainment challenge areas. But I will say, I do welcome the increase in school clothing grants for primary and secondary school pupils and the full Best Start Bright Futures plan has some commendable ideas. However, you can understand my cautious optimism in relation to some measures, such as promises from the Scottish Government to provide digital devices for every school child by 2026. We need the Scottish Government to make good on its promises in the immediate term, not in four years. I would rather um, finish my speech, thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I am actually surprised by the appearance of this pledge in the government's motion today, as though the rollout of digital devices so far has been something to be applauded. The Cabinet Secretary earlier on spoke about devices being delivered. However, in my region, over 80% of the pupils from West Dumbartonshire are still waiting for the digital devices, and over 90% in East Dumbartonshire are also waiting. With the initial rollout stemming from the pandemic and the very slow delivery of devices having little to no impact on digital poverty, it is now imperative that pupils who have missed out are able to catch up. I would therefore urge the Scottish Government to back our national tutoring scheme, something we have championed for over a year and which could make a real difference to young people's education. As for the removal of music tuition fees, some councils were giving music lessons for free. However, these charges had been increasing in more local authorities over the last 10 years because of the cuts to the core council funding. So although we welcome the removal of charges, we wish it had not been necessitated by the legacy of SNP cuts to the core local government funding. The Scottish Conservatives welcome commitments to ensuring low-income families do not incur cost for curriculum-related trips. And we want to take it a step further and urge everyone across this chamber to back my colleague Liz Smith as she takes forward her Member's Bill to make it a statutory requirement for local authorities to offer 12 to 16 years old at least one week of residential outdoor education, which was actually highlighted by the member Kukab Stewart on trips outside of school. In conclusion, presiding officer, reducing the attainment gap is a key priority for the Scottish Conservatives. We believe that children from all backgrounds should have equal footing when it comes to attainment. And we can do this by firstly investing one billion in the attainment gap, ensuring it is allocated effectively. Secondly, speeding up the rollout of the digital devices and introducing a national tutoring scheme to help pupils catch up. And last but not least, presiding officer, maximising efforts to ensure that pupils' only concerns when they are at school is learning. Thank you, Ms. Gozal. I now call on Evelyn Tweed to be followed by Marie McNair. Around six minutes, Ms. Tweed. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Firstly, for the record, I am a serving councillor at Stirling Council. I grew up a child of a single mum on a poor council estate in Ayr, so I have some understanding of poverty and the challenges facing families today. My mum worked part time in Greggs and to give me a real school uniform every year, she had to purchase it on credit at an exorbitant interest rate. We relied heavily on school meals so that I got at least one decent school meal a day. All through my school years, clothes and toys were in short supply. For example, I did not own my own bicycle until I could afford to buy one aged 22. And of course, at school, I of often felt excluded as others enjoyed trips 
or had the latest fashions, and we have heard much about stigma today. I recall the benefit system at the time certainly was not generous, and child benefit was something we came to rely on. I will never forget the look on my mum's face when I managed to lose the payment one day on the way back from the post office. Even after all these years, that look still haunts me. So I have had first-hand experience of the hard choices and challenges that face families living on the breadline. And as a result, I am determined that all children should have a good start in life. It is part of the reason that I get into politics. If you put yourself in the shoes of a low-income family, it is not hard to see why tackling child poverty is a number one priority for the SNP and our government. Children from poor households do not just suffer from a lack of material things or decent food. They get bullied at school for having less. This then impacts on their enjoyment of school and, and, and on their ability to succeed there. And leaving school without making the most of opportunities is likely to result in a vicious poverty cycle. A child's experiences of school and their family's income are strongly linked. A 2007 Joseph Rowntree Foundation study found that school children from poorer families had narrower and less rich experiences, with children in disadvantaged schools having less access to music, art and out-of-school activities. Alarmingly, this study also highlighted that poorer children accepted that they were not going to get the same quality of schooling or the same outcomes as better-off children. Every child should have the same opportunities, and I know this government is committed to making a fairer society for all. The Child Poverty Bill, passed unanimously in 2017, set out the targets to reduce the number of children experiencing the effects of poverty by 2030. Since then, the SNP and the Scottish Government have been working with charities, think tanks and the education community to break down the financial barriers that face a quarter of our children. The cost of a school day for low-income children is now mitigated by measures such as free breakfast clubs, free school meals and uniform allowance, plus supporting more parents with free childcare so that they can go to work and earn more for their families. It is good to see the shared priorities of local and national government make an impact. In my constituency, Stirling Council has introduced breakfast clubs, clothing grants and other measures to help families. The Scottish Government has also brought forward progressive policies like increasing the Scottish Child Payment, which 1,360 children across Stirling have benefited from. It is our raison d'etre to help struggling families. Think tanks and anti-poverty campaigners are generally in agreement that the Scottish Government's child poverty strategy could make a huge difference in maximising household resources and improving children's wellbeing and life chances. However, though our progress and commitment has been good, a question remains. How do we ensure this progress is not undone by the growing cost of living crisis unhelped by a woefully ignorant UK Tory government. And it's quite shameful that the Tories ruthlessly cut the £20 universal credit uplift at a time when families were at their lowest point. The Scottish Government's welfare reform impact on families with children report earlier this year estimated that 70,000 people in Scotland, including 30,000 children, would be lifted out of poverty by 2024 if UK government welfare, welfare reforms introduced since 2015 were reversed. Due to the number of mitigation policies in Scotland which put people before profit, child poverty here is notably lower at 24% compared to 30% in England. This includes a focus on the availability of social housing, and local government schemes such as the Scottish Welfare Fund and council tax reduction, which help prevent destitution. 
However, I am concerned that the pandemic and ongoing cost of living crisis will make our targets difficult to meet unless additional support is provided by Westminster or ultimately we achieve independence to control our own financial levers. Sorry, Member, I'm just about to finish. Our promises provide hope and implementing these promises is key. I am proud to say that Scotland is a much better place for low-income children now than when I was a youngster, thanks to the SNP. When we invest in our children's welfare, we invest in the welfare of all. And I welcome this motion. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reed. I now call on Marie McNair to be followed by Paula Kane for around uh, six minutes, please, McNair. Ms. McNair. Thank you, President Officer. I am pleased to speak in this debate about what can be done to assist with the cost of the school day, especially at a time when families across Scotland are struggling with the current cost of living crisis. We know that this cost of living crisis has been the biggest fall in living standards since records began. That is why it is important that we take a planned approach. We must ensure that everything feasible is done to reduce the costs facing families from the cost of the school day. The approach set out by the Scottish Government is welcome and it will be of great assistance to many families across Scotland. It is also in tune with our national mission to eradicate child poverty. I welcome the investment that is removing barriers to education, including the removal of the core curriculum costs for all primary and secondary pupils. This will ensure that families do not have to meet the cost of resources and materials for practical lessons. The change in mindset that the cost of school day approach is bringing about will continue to see financial barriers to education removed. To be successful, it must listen and act on the issues that parents have identified. It also needs to be the mindset within our schools, with head teachers and staff being aware of potential unintended implications of money being sought to facilitate school activities and events. I have seen the effectiveness of this type of approach firsthand in my role as a councillor on Western Bartonshire Council, and I draw members' attention to my register of interest. In Western Bartonshire, every head teacher has undertaken training on the impacts of poverty and adversity on children and families. All schools have undertaken training on mitigating against the cost of the school day. All schools are committed to working with their parents and partners to address the challenges of poverty and to reduce barriers to inclusion as a result of poverty. A multi-agency group of staff have worked together to produce a cost of school day resource, which reflects surveys of parents and their views. This resource provides support and guidance to establishments and highlights barriers and ways to overcome these. A short life working group is leading authority wide developments in addressing inequality and supporting establishments in addressing this with their school communities. I am clear that our schools are committed to reducing financial and other barriers to education, and the step change made by this approach should not be underestimated. Parents are being listened to, and their concerns have secured necessary change. We must match this step change by continuing to roll out policy that puts money in the pockets of families and gives financial support they need. That was especially important during the pandemic and now during this cost of living crisis. That is why in Western Bartonshire we took the decision to double our payment of the school clothing grant to £300. And that is why the Scottish Government has doubled the Scottish child payment and will increase it to £25. And that is why we have uprated Scottish benefits by 6% at a time when the Westminster Government uprate benefits by only half this amount. And, President Officer, I take this further opportunity to call on them to do the right thing and follow our approach to uprating. I also welcome our decision to, to mitigate... Yep. Pam Duncan Glancy. Sir, and thank you to the member for taking that intervention. Um, in line with uh, such an approach to, to uprating, will, you, will um, the member also support a doubling of the carers' allowance supplement so that that too can be uprated? Ms McNair. Uh, thank you for that. Certainly we will look at that. Um, continuing on, I also welcome a decision to mitigate the benefit cap. This Westminster policy deliberately uh, deprives families with children of the basic subsistence levels within the UK social security system. Our commitment to free school meals is also massively important in reducing the cost of school while providing nutritional meals to our young people. Important too is the continuation of the education maintenance allowance when it was scrapped in other parts of the UK. 
And also one of our best start grants is paid when a child starts school, in recognition that this is a time that puts more financial pressure on families with children. It is no surprise then that the Child Poverty Action Group point out in the report the cost of the child in Scotland that the combined value of Scottish Government policies and lower childcare costs will reduce the net costs of bringing up a child by up to 31 per cent. That is nearly 24,000 for lower income families. So there is a wide financial package available to reduce the cost of the school day and support families in a wider setting. But it is not enough, President Officer. We must maximise take up of this approach through access to advice and innovative approaches that minimise bureaucracy. And as the Child Poverty Action Group points out, this support is one of the positive things achieved from the cost of school day approach. I welcome the continued commitment to this from the Scottish Government and local actions across Clybank and Mogai. In conclusion, President Officer, I wholeheartedly welcome the Scottish Government's support for a cost of the school day approach. I pay tribute to all schools across my constituency, our teachers, all staff in our, our schools, our senior education officers, for the commitment and compassion, for the determination to ensure that unnecessary costs are removed from the school curriculum and that financial barriers are removed so that access to education is not shaped by your ability to pay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms McNair. I now call on Paul O'Kane to be followed by Jim Fairley for around six minutes. Mr O'Kane. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And following the, the two previous speakers, uh, I will also declare an interest, perhaps for the last time in this chamber, as a serving councillor in East Renfrewshire Council. And I am pleased to be able to contribute to this debate uh, this afternoon. I want to begin by praising the excellent work of our schools and the many dedicated staff who work in them day in and day out, because schools are so much more than just places of learning. I am sure we can all agree uh, that in our own communities we see schools at the very centre of supporting children and young people and their families to grow and thrive in safe and supported uh, environments. I am sure we have all had experience of that wider role that schools can play in bringing communities together and meeting people where they are in order to work as hard as possible with them to respond to their needs. And that means all children and all families and a relentless focus on breaking down the barriers that exist to achieving the full potential of every learner. In preparing for today's debate, uh, I have been thinking about the genuine transformative power that experiences in and around school life can have on a young person. My mum taught in a primary school for 40 years and still speaks about so many of the young people that she taught and supported to experience the world both inside and out with the classroom. The first time a child has the opportunity to learn a musical instrument and perform for their classmates. When a child learns to swim and takes to the deep end on their own for the very first time. Or taking a school trip away from home for the first time to Iona or an outward bound and watching children wonder in history or nature. It may seem simple, but there is power in these things. And as CPAG have pointed out in their work on in-school poverty, children are missing out on having fun. But I think it's more fundamental than that. Children are often missing out on being themselves and learning about themselves. And that's why I commend the work done by CPAG on supporting schools to think about how to make these experiences as accessible and cost neutral as possible, something that teachers like my mum and many, many others have been doing for many years. But we know that with diminishing financial resources, it becomes harder and harder. And we know that it often falls to staff, parent councils, charities, churches, and others to help plug the gap. Presiding officer, we also know that the cost of the fundamentals of the school day, such as uniform costs, PE kit, food, equipment and digital access, all continue to rise. And that's why it's right that the government has worked with COSLA on increasing the school clothing grant and the expanded provision of free school meals. But it's clear that councils have also gone above and beyond in extremely difficult circumstances. Whether it's Labour-led North Lanarkshire combating holiday hunger with Club 365 and providing the first ever clothing grant for nursery children, and I'm sure Bob Doris just forgot to mention or didn't get to mention North Lanarkshire, and I won't mention all of the communities in North Lanarkshire who are benefiting from that holiday hunger programme. I'll, I'll let other, other colleagues perhaps do that. Certainly give way. Bob Doris. I am sure the member will want to concur that there is great work across all local authorities to address these issues and much of the, the stuff in 
the Labour amendment is going to be taking place across Scotland in SNP Glasgow, and I understand from what you say, North Lanark should also. Paul okay. I thank the member for that intervention. And, and I do, I, the point I'm making is that councils have gone above and beyond to help deliver much of this agenda as well. And Labour-led North Ayrshire in my own region have invested in a scheme directed at tackling the cost of the school day, with half a million pounds already invested to overcome what are the key financial barriers to participation at school. Uh, for children from low-income houses, and that is looking at delivering equal access to food, clothing and digital resources in order to poverty-proof uh, the school day. And I know we have heard from other colleagues about where that is happening in other parts of the country as well. But these councils are struggling to deliver this in the face of years of cuts from this Government. The Government motion speaks uh, about the removal of core curriculum charges and a myriad of initiatives. But much of this is simply replacing funding already stripped from local government education budgets, as I think we have heard already. Many of these, certainly. Pam Gosal. Does the member believe that basically a slow rollout of these devices to um, uh, the pupils in Scotland uh, has little or no impact on digital poverty? And with the obviously interest in the area that I'm in, West and East Dumbartonshire, with over 80%, 90% still to be delivered, does the member believe that the SNP Scottish Government is failing the pupils of Scotland? Paul okay. well, I thank my regional colleague for that intervention. I, mean, I think it, there is clearly concern about the, the pace of um, these devices being rolled out. It was fundamentally important last year uh, during the lockdown period that young people had access to digital devices in order to ensure that they could learn from home. And I know from my own experience in the Council in East Renfrewshire um, that the rollout of monies from government has been slow and has been patchy. And I think we would all want to see progress in that. And I do hope that the Minister will be able to say something in her concluding remarks about what progress they intend to make in order to ensure that this is delivered as reality. It is all very well to say a device for every child, but we need to know when that is going to happen. Because, as I have already said, many of these are headlines not yet delivered, timescales slipping. And we know about things like free lunches, but breakfast clubs in many local authorities were cut years ago, and local authorities have not been given appropriate capital funding, as I referenced earlier, to deliver increased dining space. We talk about free instrumental tuition. But many bands and orchestras have already folded, and work to reach the poorest children with music tuition has stopped. And as we've just heard, a digital device for every child, but hundreds still waiting. And also council family learning services and outreach has been decimated. So it is clear that we need to look at the fundamentals in order to tackle poverty in our schools and in our communities. We need childcare that supports people to access learning and the labour market, with councils and partner providers fully funded to deliver with the genuine flexibility that was promised and is required. And we need wraparound childcare, not just in those early years, but also before and after school, where we know that childcare can be exorbitant. And given the context of COVID-19, we need a recovery that works for everyone. And that means universal availability of holiday clubs and extracurricular activities to help all of our children and young people bounce back, particularly in terms of their mental health and wellbeing. And in concluding, Deputy Presiding Officer, all evidence shows that addressing issues of poverty during childhood and in school vastly increases the life chances of those raised in low-income households. Poverty touches all areas of life, and we on these benches believe fighting to end poverty should be the key priority of everything we do in this Parliament. And that begins with our youngest citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Mr O'Kane. I now call on Jim Fairley, who will be the final speaker in the open debate, and just remind all members who have participated in the debate that they need to be here for the start of the closing speeches for around six minutes, Mr Fairley. Thank you, President Officer. I remember when I went to school getting free school dinners, and I really did not think anything of it, and why would you, until someone of course pointed out to me that that meant I must be poor, despite the fact that my dad worked two jobs while I was a student and my mum was working as well. And that's where stigma kicks in. And that stigma makes you feel like you're a charity case and that there are things that others can access that are just simply not for you. And I take Bob Doris's point that we're talking about personal things while we're in this chamber are very well paid. But I think it's important that we do talk about them because we need to make sure that people understand we're talking from someplace that we actually understand ourselves. It doesn't just make you feel bad. It can lead to problems with your learning. <clears throat> children develop an attitude of questioning what their worth is in the educational system <clears throat> and it can affect excuse me and that can affect their ambition their attainment narrows and their sense of options and opportunities that are open to them that feeling of 
that's only for other folk, becomes the automatic thought. Another very sharp memory that I've got from my school days that is relevant to today's debate is a primary seven. Um, my headmaster came in and typed primary seven and coming into the class to tell us that they were arranging a trip, a four day trip to York, which sounded brilliant, but it costed forty pounds. It cost forty pounds. I didn't even tell my parents about it. And when they found out, they were absolutely gutted that I should be so aware of family financial constraints that I had put it out of my head straight away. And my dad might actually be furious that I'm raising it today, but uh, we've got to talk about this stuff. I should add, they found the £40 and had a fantastic trip to York and thoroughly enjoyed it. But we've got to, if we have to recognise and tackle the impact that poverty and the stigma of poverty can have on a child's education, and as importantly, a child's self-worth and belief in themselves. We need to make sure that education isn't something that you buy. And education is a, just, just about academics of education. It's about that whole school experience. Schools should enrich your children and not make them feel poorer. That school is a place where they feel they belong, not somewhere they're made to feel different or aren't not good enough because they don't have enough money. And, why is it that st and that's why the steps that this Scottish Government has taken and which are recognised in today's motion are so important. Getting a child kitted, getting kitted out for school can be a daunting prospect, but helpful measures like increasing the school clothing grant and producing guidance to reduce school uniform costs place on families is helping. In my days, we all went during the summer holidays to pick berries, and that's how we paid for our uniforms. But you can't get properly educated if you're hungry. That phrase that Billy Kay would have recognised today, a hungersome wane has near lugs, is where Breakfast clubs and free school meals, nutritious school meals, play such a key role, and universal provision removes the stigma that attaches to them. And I don't want families on fixed incomes and tight budgets to experience that sinking feeling when they open their child's school bag and find the letter about the school trip or the music lesson that they will have to find money to pay for, or a way to let their child down without making them feel bad. I don't want our parents to think up an excuse to get their child out of doing cooking classes, for example, because they can't pay for the contributions to the ingredients. The Scottish Government's commitment to removing core curriculum charges, ensuring low-income families don't face those costs for curriculum-related trips and abolishing fees for instrumental music tuition are really important in that regard. And there are other steps being taken, not mentioned in this motion, that will help ease the cost of the school day for folk as well. After school clubs or sports training sessions, that means your child will miss the free school bus going home, would have to come out of your normal budget. That is no longer the case, because under this SNP government, children get to travel free on buses now. The introduction... Yes, I will. Martin Whitfield. I am very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I am very grateful to the member to give way. Does he not also, however, share my concern that the travel costs for trips during the day are excessive and indeed place huge financial burden on schools, which isn't being alleviated by the free bus pass. Jim Fairley. I would, I would absolutely concur that any extra cost put on a family in this cost of living crisis is absolutely terrible. But as Ros Greer pointed out, the school education system can't sort out the problems of poverty. The introduction and recent doubling of child payment is an incredibly helpful boost to low-income families. And just today, the plans have been announced to automatically pay the Best Start grant early learning and school age payments to parents and carers who already receive Scottish Child Payment when their children become eligible. Automatic payments are important. Less paperwork, less asking for help, and less of that sense that you are holding out the begging bowl. The change will be introduced later this year when the child payment is extended to under 16s and increased to, to £25 per child per week. The SNP government may have one arm tied when it is backed by the Tory government in Westminster, but it is nevertheless winning a tug of war. Benefit cuts and bedroom taxes may threaten to make life harder for Scottish families, but we are fortunate in having a Scottish government shielding, ameliorating and mitigating the worst of the Tory attacks on the poor. Over £1.4 billion to mitigate some of the UK Tory government's welfare benefit cuts is just part of the cost of the union to Scotland. And the positive steps taken by the Scottish Government, which I have highlighted, and some which are listed in the motion, are a pointer to the fairer, better Scotland we could build with full access to our own resources and the proper powers of a normal nation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Fairley. We now draw to the... Uh Closing uh, speeches, I note that Cocab Stewart is not present in the uh, chamber. would expect an explanation for that. Uh, and I call Martin Whitfield for around seven minutes, please. Very grateful, Deputy Presiding Officer. And it is a great pleasure to close this debate on behalf of Scottish Labour. 
Child poverty, those ongoing costs of living crisis, it goes against everything that Scottish Labour stands for. Our young people can't reach their full potential unless they're supported properly during their early and school years to get the education, the care, the skills that they need to thrive. And indeed, it was a great pleasure in this debate for so much of it to be listened to by a school party that joined us. And I hope they took from this what is a consensus across this Parliament, that we need to fight child poverty, we need to fight poverty in Scotland, and we do need to make this the best place for a young person to grow up in. I welcomed the um, initial uh, statement from Shillianne Zummerville, and I was grateful for the comments with regard to data, because one of the challenges is that data is a problem. The sharing of data between local authorities the Scottish Social Security, indeed the Scottish Government and others. If we want to um, make sure that the highest level of take-up of benefits and other resources available to our families occurs in Scotland, we need to find a way through the maze that is GDPR, not just across Scotland, but also between the Scottish Government and indeed the Westminster Government. And I hope the Minister has an opportunity to reaffirm um, the commitment to find a way through that gap. Because if we are to um, do better for our families, it is in these small steps that we will see the greatest benefits. So many speakers this afternoon have spoken about free school meals. And indeed, when we look at the statistics of availability for free school meals, it's interesting that the last um, cumulative statistics date from 2019 and were published in 2020 when at that stage 38% of pupils in Scotland were entitled to free school meals, but of that only 78.1% took it up. 78.1%, over 20% of young people entitled to free school meals couldn't take it up. I welcome the move away from free school meals as being an assessment um, of financial stability. However, I'm extremely concerned that in moving away from such a relatively simple statistic to collect, we will lose families in this. And there are people who will be in a hidden poverty that they can't escape from, and that so much of the potential that's been talked about this afternoon goes amiss for those individuals, because that in itself would be tragic. Looking at some of the other statements, can I again, and I've found myself doing this already before uh, in this session, um, say an enormous thank you to Ele Eleanor Whittam for her ability to share her experience of growing up and for her to be able to articulate what it feels like to grow up in a house which is different from perhaps some of her friends. And I found it very powerful, her statement, that children are aware of children who are in poverty and that children take decisions that they feel they ought to for their parents about what they should and shouldn't share with them. And I think of all, and there have been many contributions of personal experiences this afternoon, I think that moment to think that a young person chooses not to share something with their family because of their perception of where their family is compared to others, a truly tragic flag that sits in Scotland. And I think across this chamber we must agree to try and bring an end to that stigma. And bringing an end to that stigma comes in many, many ways. It is not as simple as just improving the school situation. Indeed, as Ross Greer rightly said, the schools are not the answer to this poverty. The answer lies in a myriad of other decisions taken away, and I hope that Ross would agree with me that similarly the schools cannot be held, responsibility, cannot be held responsible if those poverty targets, three out of four which we look like we're going to miss, should try to be held responsible for that. It is broader and it rests in this chamber and on this government. And I thank Ross again for um, allowing the intervention regarding specialist sports gear, and I raise it not because of my um, brilliant athletic attributes at school, but indeed because of the challenges that I've had speaking to young children who want to play rugby uh, where I grow up, and the challenge of even buying specialist boots, the helmet to wear in scrums, and other protection that is required. And again, I would look to the Minister in summing up to be able to say, 
whether or not this is going to be part of the consideration um, going forward. So, it has been an interesting debate. It's been a fascinating debate. I would like to have heard people talk about young people having a voice in this debate. If I can mention one thing that has been absent from all of the speeches, it is actually perhaps listening to, liaising with, and talking to our young people about the experiences that perhaps are very hard to articulate at their stage, but to ask high school pupils what it was like to be in primary school when you had to wear a different band if you had a free school meal, or your order was taken differently. And to those who couldn't make their P7 residential trip because their family couldn't afford it. And I think to come back to what has been consistent throughout this is a desire across this chamber for an education system that will facilitate our young people to have better adult life and break, as has been described, that cycle of poverty. Our young people should expect exactly what every other young person wants from the desire to be a professional footballer, an astronaut, a nurse, a doctor, whatever they want to be that they're asked about in those P1 classes, what can you do? To meet a policeman and want to be a policeman, possibly even want to be a teacher. They should be empowered to do that because that is the dreams that they have and nothing in Scotland should take those dreams away from them. And every child, irrespective of the school they go to, irrespective of the community they come from, should demand from this government and from this chamber that they have their right, their right to see through their dream. There's been a lot positive said this afternoon, but I now turn to the government and I would ask them, we have heard so much, please, please ensure that you deliver on this, that you set out the measurements that we can say success is being achieved. Let's not look next year where three out of four of our poverty targets aren't being reached because there is cross-party cross agreement to this and you will have it provided you can show that success is on the way. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you. I now call on Megan Gallagher. Up to eight minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome the opportunity to close this debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. The cost of a school day per child for low-income families can be a tough financial burden to bear. As we have heard throughout today's contributions, this has only been exacerbated by the pandemic and the rising cost of living. MSPs need to utilise the powers we have in this Parliament to introduce policies to help and support those who need it most. If we look at the performance of this Scottish Government in relation to education standards throughout Scotland, they have not fulfilled their promise to parents and their young people to make education their number one priority. The SNP have had 15 years in office to make a difference, but they have failed to make meaning meaningful improvements to the life chances of our young people. As we all know, a good education and positive destinations for our young people are paramount to tackling poverty. However, disadvantaged children continue to have lower attainment than their peers. The SNP has never fully got to grips with tackling the attainment gap and it is our young people who continue to suffer, and this was raised by Pam Gossel and others during their contributions. If we take numeracy and literacy results as an example, the size of the gaps in 2020-21 were larger than at any previous point since comparable data was made available in 2016-17. This shows that standards are slipping, and the Scottish Government must explain why this has gotten worse under their watch. Uh, yes, certainly. Just, oh, Doris. I was really interested in thanking them for giving away. The member mentioned uh, positive destinations. A couple of weeks ago, data came out on positive destinations. There's record levels of positive destinations, particularly from schools serving the most deprived areas. Can you say something, find it in your heart to say something positive about that and the success of Scottish education? Megan Gallagher. Um, we're making improvements, but we're not making improvements quickly enough, and that is the problem that we're facing just now, and this is what the Scottish Government must get to grips with. The Scottish Government initially set out funding for North Lanarkshire Council alongside, alongside eight other challenge authorities, which Michael Mara mentioned during his contribution, specifically targeting these areas to improve attainment and reduce poverty levels. However, since this has been scrapped, and all local authorities will now have to share this funding, and regrettably, this takes away from areas such as North Lanarkshire and shows that the Scottish Government do not have a clear plan to tackle the attainment gap in areas of real needs. 
And this, combined with the revised attainment gap funding being cut, will not help improve outcomes for our young people or help to reduce the cost of the school day. Presiding officer, we heard some interesting contributions this afternoon. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned the 1140 hours early learning and childcare programme during her contribution, which is something that is unanimously supported throughout this Parliament. However, once again, when asked about the unfair funding formula created by this Government and it's causing nurseries within the PVI sector to close and reduce their hours, not much was given in terms of a response. This needs sorted urgently, and I once again urge the Scottish Government to take action and to review the funding formula for the PVI and local authorities to make sure that the 1140-hour programme is fair for all. Oliver Mundell mentioned the desperate state of our schools and how schools struggle to function with providing basic stationery for the classroom. He also mentioned the reduction in teacher numbers, which has undoubtedly impacted our most vulnerable young people. Michael Mara spoke about the pressures faced by the childcare sector and the SNP's failed laptop rollout. 30 per cent of laptops distributed is nowhere near good enough, as many of our young people are still without this vital tool to assist them with their school work. And this was also raised by my colleague Stephen Kerr, who reiterated how important education is to helping our young people have the best start in life. One other issue that has been raised this afternoon by Pam Duncan Glancy and others is the important role that local authorities play in reducing the cost of the school day for low income families. And I will refer members to my register of interest, as, like other councillors this afternoon, I am in my final week or nearing my final week of being a councillor. And it was an honour and a privilege to serve my local community over the last five years and, like other councillors, tried my best to make improvements in the ward area that I represented. One of the biggest frustrations, however, I experienced during my time as a councillor is the lack of funding councils receive from the Scottish Government to help tackle the cost of the school day for low-income families. During this year's budget process, at one stage, councils did have to navigate a real-term reduction in funding of roughly £264 million. We heard at that time that councils' leaders branded this as barely survivable, with many having to make cuts in their education budgets to balance the books. In my view, it is local authorities who are best placed to implement policies which benefit the unique needs of an area. For example, Forgewood in Motherwell has completely different challenges, social and economic, to Giffnock, for example, in Eastwood. However, the SNP's obsession with centralisation has led to councils being stripped of their ability to make good local policies that will benefit the people who live in that local authority area. The Scottish Government should empower our councils to reduce the cost of the school day for low-income families. But by cutting budgets year on year, it has led to many services that assist with the cost of the school day being reduced or scrapped altogether. Yes, certainly. Claire Hawley. Thanks very much. And I am very grateful to the member for taking an intervention. Does she recognise the impact on families in Scotland that a decade of damaging austerity cuts, Brexit price raises, and economic mismanagement have caused to children and families right across this land. Will she join me in calling on the UK Government to scrap the national insurance tax hike, reverse their cuts to universal credit, and raise pensions and benefits which are reserved instead of imposing real-term cuts? Megan Gallagher. President Officer, do you know what I condemn? I condemn the Scottish Government lavishing millions of pounds of taxpayers' money to fund yet another referendum instead of using that money to invest in our schools and other council services, what we are debating in this chamber today. As I was saying, uh, presiding officer, breakfast clubs are important for many young people, and it is not just politicians in this chamber who share this view. A recent poll showed that almost all teachers surveyed believe that breakfast is important for pupils, and research shows that having breakfast improves school performance. By not having this service for parents or by increasing the cost of school meals, this contributes to the financial pressures that many parents face. It is my view that the Scottish Government must fund councils properly so they can provide not only breakfast clubs but also other innovative ideas that help families reduce the cost of the school day for low-income families. And before I conclude my remarks, presiding officer, I would like to raise one last concern that relates to the Scottish Government's consultation to remove school uniforms for secondary school pupils and the unintended consequences this could have on families and families' expenses. Uniforms are an integral and sensible part of school life, but they also give pupils a sense of dignity and foster discipline. 
but most importantly, they promote equality throughout the school setting. If we had to change um, the, the, or remove school uniforms from our schools, parents who are struggling financially may not be able to dress their children in expensive, fashionable or designer clothing. My concern is this could lead to bullying or young people being made to feel inferior to their peers. And again, this was a concern that was raised by SNP members who said that dress down days can be difficult for families to afford. And I think, again, the comment that was raised by Ross Greer and others was right in, the, um, in relation to bespe uh, specific um, items for school uniforms, and that needs to be looked at. Although I understand that the fo following the largest survey of school uniforms in the UK, the School Wear Association has found that the average cost of a compulsory uniform in sportswear items is roughly £101.19 per pupil. However, if you had to cost the average fashionable or designer outfit, it would be significantly more. And this is why we have clothing grants available for families who need to sorry, I'm about to conclude, who need this additional support. And it goes back to my earlier point. If councils were funded properly, they could make the choice to increase this grant to assist with the cost of the school day for low income families. To conclude, Presiding Officer, it is disappointing that the SNP has turned up today to give themselves a pat on the back for some of the measures they have introduced without taking any responsibility for the significant improvements they still have to make in reducing Thank the you, cost of the school day for low-income families. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Shirley Ann Somerville to wind up. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. It is the Scottish Government's aim to build an education system that ensures equal access to that full package of education, breaking down financial barriers to make a real difference to the lives of children. And I was particularly struck by uh, those who have spoken from across the chamber uh, about uh, the children's uh, own experiences of poverty while they are in school, the decisions that they take in an attempt to protect their family from some of the costs of the school day. And we should all be cognisant of that. And I'm also uh, particularly cognisant of the point that Martin Whitfield made about the importance of listening to child experiences and to their voices through this. And I would reassure him that I, that is very much the government's um, attention on this and on all education um, policies. We've heard uh, some discussion from across uh, the chambers uh, about the Scottish education system in general. And I, I think we should... Uh, highlight uh, some key facts uh, before I um, really move into my closing remarks. Before the pandemic, we did see a year-on-year -year trend in CFE levels that was positive. We were seeing progress. In 2021, we had the most passes at higher since the advent of devolution. And as I think as Bob Doris pointed out earlier, we have just recently recorded uh, the record high positive destinations for our young people. We have a lot to be proud of in our education system, but we of course know that there is much more to do. And within the context of poverty, it is very important that we recognise the impact of that. So we have made um, developments and improvements through our first tackle in child poverty delivered to delivery plan, but we know that there's more to do. The almost 2.18 billion that was estimated within the previous plan to have been directly benefiting children is a great investment by the government, but we know there is much more. And that is why we have increased the value of eight Scottish Social Security benefits by 6 per cent, a great deal more than has happened with the Westminster Reserves. And of course, why we have doubled the game-changing Scottish child payment to £20 and will increase it again to £25 and, of course, extend the payment to children under 16 by the end of the year. That is five times higher than the £5 payment we were being asked to reduce less than five years ago. And again, as Bob Doris pointed out, that is a, a result of that increase that by the end of 2022, our package of five family benefits for low-income families will be worth £10,000 by the time a family's first child turns six. That is a difference of more than £8,200 for every eligible child born in Scotland compared to other places in the UK. And that, I think, highlights the unparalleled support by this government. But I would also turn to a point made by Oliver Mundell when he said in his opening remarks, I'm not denying that there are challenges there when challenged by my, my colleague eh, on the impact of the UK government. We can't get away from the impact that the UK government has on discussing poverty. And Evelyn Tweed's eh, remarks today really did show the impact that that's having on families right across Scotland. 
But we are seeing developments within the Scottish Attainment Challenge funding to ensure that we are supporting our schools and particularly supporting our head teachers. In March, I launched the Refresh Scottish Attainment Challenge programme with up to £200 million worth of funding for the year ahead, part of our increased £1 billion investment over this Parliament. Recognising that poverty exists in every community, a portion of the £200 million funding will be extended to all local authorities within Scotland. That approach was developed and agreed by COSLA through that process, because it is very important that we recognise that poverty exists everywhere. And I think Oliver Mandel is about to intervene, I hope, uh, can we to tell, uh, uh, presiding officer, uh, to tell me where we should cut the money from if he does not agree with the changes that COSLA and the Scottish Government made. Oliver Mandel. Well, we have heard in this debate already about the significant waste uh, that we have seen from this Government mm -hmm. uh, and money spent on constitutional obsessions. Mm -hmm. But how can the Cabinet Secretary sit there and say that cutting support to some of our poorest communities is the right thing to do? We heard from one of our backbenchers uh, that some of the Scottish Government's initiatives were a foretaste uh, of what we get in an independent Scotland. Is that one of them? Cabinet Secretary. Well, once again, Oliver Mandel does not actually um, deal with the challenge that governments have about ensuring that we are delivering a fair funding settlement to 32 local authorities. And it is unfortunate that these Scottish Conservatives do still feel uh, that they wish to see that money being taken away from the other local authorities that we have just given money to. Oliver Mandel, again with his open remarks, attacks curriculum for excellence. A knowledge-based mindset is apparently what we need. I think perhaps Mr Mandel should expand uh, his reading list, presiding officer, and look at what the OECD have said, that to shift away from the traditional knowledge versus skills focus by acknowledging the importance of both in learning. And it is important that we acknowledge knowledge and uh, acknowledge the importance of knowledge versus skills on that. I'm afraid, given the length of your uh, previous intervention, no, I will not. Michael Mara uh, did also um, ask about the financial sustainability of uh, the um, uh, early learning and childcare, and we have, of course, uh, produced funding, um, produced figures for the financial sustainability um, health check, and we are committed to publishing data on local authority and ELC funding rates um, annually. He also challenged the government to um, act rather than just talk, and I would remind him of what has already been delivered uh, by this uh, government very recently, core curriculum charges removed, an increase in the universalism for free school meals to primaries four and five, music tuition fees removed, school clothing grants increased, 2,000 more teachers than pre-pandemic, 1140 childcare hours delivered, support for free school meals in holiday, free bus travel for under 22s. I could go on, presiding officer. Co-Cab Stewart also... Oh, Stephen Kerr. She didn't mention, uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary did not mention free devices, so let me ask her a question about free devices and free internet connections, because they go together. How many of the current secondary school population in Scotland will leave school without getting the advantage of a free device and a free internet connection? Because... By her own words, many of the young people in Scotland schools will never see the delivery of that SNP so-called election promise. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I can give you this time back. Thank you, Presiding Officer. He, uh, Mr Kerr will, of course, uh, be fully cognisant of the pledge that was in the manifesto was for the delivery um, of the devices and the connectivity by the end of the parliamentary term. That is exactly what this government is determined to do. Cocab Stewart uh, also mentioned the important work um, done by CPAG on the cost of the school day. Um, some of that work, of course, funded by the Scottish Government, but through the Scottish uh, Attainment uh, Challenge funding. And I think it is very important work that has been done by CPAG, giving very practical advice to schools right across the country, uh, and I would commend them for it. Ross Greer and um, others um, talked about the importance of the school uniform guidance, which I will be uh, very pleased to uh, work with uh, Mr Greer on um, during um, our time um, in our partnership together. Uh, can I make very clear, though, I'm not sure where the Scottish Conservatives are getting this from, we are not taking away school uniforms 
uh, from any school. The decision on school uniforms um, is for an individual school. What is being provided is uh, the guidance. Uh, and I take on board the point that Martin Whitfield um, mentioned um, earlier about PE. I would also say I was not one of those people who excelled um, in, um, in that um, area of expertise at school, uh, but that does not mean we, I will not uh, support those uh, who do at this time. Uh, many um, uh, people within this debate have spoken about uh, the importance of free school meals and the importance of universalism. Um, we, of course, do have um, a policy at the moment of providing um, free school meals to primaries one to five, who now benefit from balanced and nutritious free school lunches um, during school term time. And we are committed to rolling out universal free school lunches to all children in primary and special schools during this parliamentary term. Um, and this aligns, of course, uh, with our commitments on free school milk. Again, many members uh, talked about the, the real impact uh, that curriculum costs uh, can make to individual families making decisions, and indeed sometimes individual uh, children making decisions about subject uh, choices. That is exactly why the Scottish Government uh, has moved on this uh, particular issue to ensure uh, that we are providing uh, support to local government um, to ensure that there are no core curriculum costs uh, for primary and secondary school pupils. We do not want to get into uh, a position where families are being asked to meet the costs and resources for materials in practical lessons. And I do believe that the removal of the charges um, on families will support participation in core curriculum activities, which ties in, of course, to the government's action that has already been taken um, on music tuition. And, of course, uh, we are determined to do more um, with that, uh, working with our colleagues um, in COSLA to make sure that there is uh, a funding package um, in place uh, that can support the development um, of um, music tuition um, and people's experiences of um, music at school. We have also heard uh, once again the importance um, of the school clothing grant um, within um, this uh, debate and again the important role um, that has already been played by the Scottish Government in taking action on that. Uh, Mr Kerr um, earlier on uh, alluded in his remarks to digital devices. Uh, I would uh, reiterate uh, once again that our commitment is to ensure that every child has access to a device and connection by the end of this Parliament. We have already provided £25 million in 2020-21 as a response to the pandemic to deliver devices for more than 72,000 disadvantaged children, and we provided 14,000 connectivity packages to help young people get online. A further £45 million was made available earlier in, early in 2021 to support remote learning, and that was flexibly used by councils to create extra staff or to deliver even more additional devices or connectivity if that was required. It is important to recognise the work that has been taken uh, by many councils themselves um, on this area, and that is um, why we have seen in total almost 280,000 uh, devices that have been or are in the process of being distributed to learners, and that figure does include the, the devices provided by the Scottish Government. Uh, presiding officer, in conclusion, we have taken a great deal of action um, on the costs of the school day right across government. We know there is more to do. That is exactly what this motion sets out. In partnership with our colleagues in the Scottish Green Party, we are determined to take that challenge head on. So while we look at the cost of the school day and while we look at the challenges that we have within that, we absolutely still have to recognise the context that we are within within Scotland on the levels of poverty within Scotland and our determination across government to be able to tackle poverty as part of our challenge to uh, improve the life chances of young people right across Scotland. So we have seen progress in tackling the poverty-related attainment gap pre-pandemic. We know we now need to pick up that pace, but that is exactly why we have seen £1 billion attainment funding committed by this government, 3,500 additional teachers on top of those um, already recruited within the pandemic. And that is exactly why we have taken the action that I detailed earlier on in my closing remarks to tackle the school day. Presiding officer, it would be remiss of me, however, to close uh, without 
uh, wishing good luck to all the pupils right across Scotland who from today are starting their exams. And I hope on behalf of the Chamber I can wish everybody who has taken part in the exam diet this year the very best of success. That concludes the debate on reducing the cost of the school day for low-income families. It is now time to move on to the next item of business, which is consideration of motion 4115 on legislative consent motion, British Sign Language Bill, UK legislation. And I call on Claire Hawhey to move the motion. Move, presiding officer. Thank you, Minister. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. The next item of business is consideration of business motion 4172 in the name of George Adam on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau on setting out a change to this week's business. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press their request to speak button now. And I call on George Adam to move the motion. Thank you, President Officer. I am moved. Thank you, Minister. No member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion 4172 be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed, and there are four questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first is that Amendment 4138.2, in the name of Oliver Mundell, which seeks to amend Motion 4138, in the name of Shirley Ann Somerville, on reducing the cost of the school day for low income families, be agreed. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.